will be there, sir. The bang, 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 bang guard will be there, sir. The bang guard will, 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 will be there, sir. The bang guard, the bang guard will be there. Beep, 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 the Vanguard will be there. Be there. Be there. What's up, everybody? Today is a very special live stream because you will finally, after much anticipation, get to hear the Vanguard discourse on Oppenheimer. Boy, Gavin really <laughs> made everybody wait for it, huh? We're, we're, we're beyond ready for this at this point, but he's finally done it. He committed to the three and a half hours. It's not even three and a half. By the time the trailers are done, it's three and a half hours of your day. Yeah, it's long, but dude. It's long. What'd you think? Worth Ooh. it? Yeah. Oh, I loved Oppenheimer. I'm so glad I finally got around to seeing it. Sorry that we're having this conversation like two weeks late. I know this is uh, old news, but yeah, I did finally get around to checking out Oppenheimer. Absolutely loved it. It totally lived up to the hype. I think it's Chris Nolan's best movie in a long time, probably since like Inception, I would say. Um, would you agree with that, Zach? What came out right after Inception? Dark Knight, uh, Dark Knight uh, Rises, Rising. Yeah. No. Tenet. And Dunkirk? Dunkirk and Tenet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, it's definitely his best movie since Inception, for sure. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I mean, I think my favorite thing about it, because I was interested to see how they would handle the, obviously, the moral issue, right? Like, was the bombing worth it? Like, I, I was hoping it wouldn't, you know, be, like, propagandistic and, you know, overly excusing the American foreign policy at the time right but i actually th that was my favorite part of the movie was that it it was like so nuanced in that regard i don't feel like it was preachy in either direction um but it still made a very like obvious point about like the fact that the you know invention of this weapon will ultimately lead to the end of the world um so i thought it was like it, on one hand not subtle but also it wasn't preachy like it wasn't trying to portray oppenheimer like a total piece of shit it was just like you know, an evil man or something. Obviously, it's a lot more complex than that. But it also wasn't trying to portray him as a hero or like some amazing American patriot that did nothing wrong. Um, so I thought that was the most interesting part of the film. And it really made you like question um, all of these kind of interesting sort of conversations about um, weapons and, you know, who has the right to control or invent such weapons of mass destruction. I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, 100%. I think that it did a really good job of humanizing um, Oppenheimer without, yeah, cr without giving him the, you know, uh, too sharp of a criticism or praise in either direction. And I also like that it was really about Oppenheimer and it was really about Oppenheimer's quest to succeed at inventing an atomic bomb. There is no footage, spoiler alert, no footage of the attacks on Hiroshima or Nagasaki, right? The, the climax of the film is when they test it and it works, right? And that's another thing that I really appreciated about the film. And I thought that was very smart was that it didn't make it about, you know, the Harry Truman decision and, you know, what the militaristic operation was. In fact, there's almost no, I don't think there's a single bit of war footage in the entire fucking movie outside right. of the like building of the uh, whatever camp uh, uh, I in yeah, and oh, I think ahead. that the, the reason why they did that, I thought that was brilliant. I think the reason why they did that is because like people in America, they didn't really even have access to images or video of what was going on outside of America. So like they heard about the bomb getting dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They heard it on the radio, but it's not like they really got to see the devastation that was a result of their work, right? Um, same with the people at home. You know, they heard about it. Oh, yay, the war is over. Um, but those images, you know, they, they didn't start like, that, that that kind of war photography and journalism just wasn't really happening in the same way at the time. So there weren't a lot of images for people in America to even reckon with the destruction abroad. Yeah. And I think that that made a huge point as well. It was just like, rah, rah, America, we ended the war. And I, I, I think that the politics of that, um, you know, were well conveyed uh, and how the, it created turmoil within Oppenheimer um, for sure. And then the other thing that I thought was that Robert Downey Jr. gave a fucking amazing performance. Uh, and, and I was just 
blown away by him. I did not. Exp- I didn't even really recognize that it was him until he'd had like maybe fifteen or twenty Same. minutes of screen time. Same with Gary like, Oldman. Damn. I didn't realize Gary Oldman yeah. was in it until the end. <laughs> Dude, Truman. Yeah, he had he had a great scene, and that was a real uh, little exchange that had happened between Truman. Shout out to Harry Truman for being a piece of shit and also being from our home state of Missouri over here. Yeah. Yeah, that was interesting. Now uh, Gary Oldman's played Truman and Churchill, which is kind of funny. Um, but yeah, overall, I thought it was a great movie. Also, we're about to move on. We're not going to bore you guys for too much longer talking about Oppenheimer. So stay tuned. We're about to get into Vosh, Anna Kasparian, and the Breaking Point segment and all that good stuff. Um, but my only other question, Zach, I know I try to say this about like every movie, but I really do feel like that Oppenheimer in some ways was about filmmaking. Like, that is Gavin's favorite take. That's <laughs> Gavin. There's a very famous take about how Inception is about filmmaking also. I see this one as way more being about filmmaking because if you think about Oppenheimer basically is the director. They build a set, quote unquote, out in the middle of nowhere, Los Alamos. They've literally built up a whole set. They bring in a crew. Oppenheimer, they say, is like the mayor, the sheriff. He's the director. Like he is literally the film director. They're creating a bomb and it's all about the like collaborative art of science but also filmmaking and then at the end of the movie what really struck me was after oppenheimer's work was done and you know the bomb is made the 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 government basically comes in takes it and says all right your work here is done we got it from here and that part really stayed with me because that's a lot like the experience of a filmmaker after they finish up the you know process of directing the movie and then have to hand it off to the studio and then it's no longer theirs you know the studio decides when and where to release it into the world um, much like the bomb itself right um obviously much different scale a lot less important work when you're talking about movie making but i saw a lot of uh, a lot of parallels there that i think probably at least drew nolan to this story um does that make sense to you do you agree oh yeah i mean for sure and i think that that's just a byproduct of people making films and and it is his work you know so subconsciously it's going to be about that in the same way that i felt that you know, Darian Aronofsky's film, while he was consciously making a film about climate change, I was also really reading it as a film about like his career and about like how he uh, creates his art and how his art is received at times. And when he's really proud of it, sometimes it's uh, not well received. And other times, like the praise feels empty because it wasn't necessarily like what he was wanting to do. And then the ambition and the, you know, blockbuster of Noah. So, yeah, I just think that I, I think that that's a totally fair analysis. And I, I think that it does make sense. Um, and I think that it's typically just the reason that uh, oftentimes you can read that in a film is because the filmmakers are just projecting themselves yeah. into whatever they're working on. And, you know, it's such an obsessive and, right. you know, at times, even though it's, there's such a group of people, it's a, such a collaborative medium, but it's also oftentimes isolating for the director uh, because they have such a singular role. Uh, right. So anyway, yeah, I completely agree. Anyway, great, great fucking movie. So glad I got a chance to check it out. Um Got a couple super chats already to get through, so let's get through these real quick and then get into our first story for today. But shout out to you, Darren. Thank you so much for the nine ninety nine. I seriously need to chat with you guys ahead of next week's episode. Yeah, I got your message about that, Darren. I know there's an article that you want to share with us in that regard. Um, so I'll definitely hit you up and we can chat about that. Yeah, shout out to you, Darren. Not sure what that reference is, but I appreciate the uh, nine ninety nine. Uh, really appreciate that uh, generous super chat from you. Yeah, shout out to you, Darren. Thank you so much. And shout out to you, Christian. Fuzzy's intro music is so dope. Yeah, it, it absolutely is, Christian. Totally. Uh, shout out to the great Fuzzy Slippers for mixing that for us. Oh, 100%. Like I said, one of the best things that ever happened to me was getting one of, uh, you know, getting our own theme song. It was like, man, yeah, it's just nice to vibe to something that's all about you. No, I'm kidding. Uh, shout out to Fuzzy Slippers, though. That, that was a hilarious mix. Yeah, shout out to you, Christian. Thank you so much once again, Fuzzy Slippers. Um, thank you, Zachary, for the 199. Thoughts on the Jimmy Dore versus Marianne debate? He's so slimy. Well, it wasn't even a debate. It was like a weird setup where he was basically just trying to make her look bad on the issue of Russia and Ukraine. It was completely dishonest. Um, and if Jimmy Dore treated every politician that way, then I wouldn't care. Um, but the fact is, we just saw this dude give the biggest fucking softball interview of all time to RFK Jr., who was absolutely to the right of Marianne Williamson on basically every single fucking issue. Um, and, and Jimmy Dore just sat there and said, uh-huh, smiled along and nod- nodded along. Meanwhile, you take Marianne Williamson, who, again, I have criticisms and disagreements with, of course. Um, th- she's not above criticism. It's okay to talk about areas of disagreement. Obviously, we've done it here on the podcast. Other people have done it before as well. Um, but you take this woman who's challenging 
Joe Biden and who who is to the left of Joe Biden by every single conceivable metric, including on Russia and Ukraine. And then you sit here and you just try to make her look like an establishment stooge. Like, what the fuck is even the point of your show anymore? What is the fucking point of your show? If you're at this point just trying to tar and feather progressives, make them look like establishment hacks and not even let them have the opportunity to explain their position. Like Marianne multiple times was like, hey, all right, you want to, you know, get into our areas of disagreement. Let me lay out my opinion. Let me actually explain where I'm coming from without a second, you know, five seconds in Jimmy Dore is just cutting her off being like, so you're just another establishment Democrat. Like, did you hear that on CNN or, or whatever? Um, completely embarrassing, completely disgusting and dishonest. And we all know what, what what he was trying to do. He had Marianne Williamson on so he could act like, I do know how to have a fucking, you know, tough interview. I do know how to be adversarial on the microphone. Oh, let me just bring in this woman who I'm, I'm not at any risk of fucking offending my audience, right? Because he's already conditioned them to dislike and distrust. And he's already tarred and feathered Marianne Williamson and anybody who's not like RFKJ, right? But he's like, let me show you how it's done here. It, it, it's so transparent, the grift that he's doing that he's completely captured by his deranged right-wing audience that he's defanged that he had. And uh, to your point the other day, Gavin, sure. Let's give him the fact that he's such an idiot and he's so lazy that through all of the times that he sat on air for thousands of people and lectured about the inequalities in Israel and Palestine, that he has absolutely no idea what he's talking about and that he retained zero information. I actually wouldn't be surprised because I do think he is very low IQ. Fine. I'll give him that. You're right, Jimmy. You're, you've probably killed enough brain cells with the bottle. Okay. That's fine. Medicare for all was your one line in the sand, right? You were always the Medicare for all guy, even when that was not true. And after you'd supported a candidate that was not in favor of the authentic Medicare for all plan, Tulsi Gabbard, and you tried to gaslight your audience into saying that you'd never, ever support anybody and you never had supported anybody who didn't, uh, you know, put Medicare for all at the top of their list, which again, wasn't true. Tulsi Gabbard tried to distinguish herself from Bernie Sanders by creating a tiered, honestly, far more capitalist Medicare for all system uh, that basically gave poor people the shaft and then still kind of called it socialism. Uh, you know, no bueno. Long story short, uh he's got nothing to say to rfkj when rfk says oh we can't even we're, who, who even knows if we can do a public option like he doesn't even have pushback when people say we have to do a public option before we like he has absolutely no idea what he's talking about the man has no political analysis of his own he just reads his lines up on stage from some sloppy stupid producer but don't worry he's actually the most pro worker commentator ever that's why his staff isn't unionized that's why they have to sign ndas uh that's why a bunch of people who have worked for him in the past want to come out and tell you that he's a complete fraud um but his audience doesn't care because the latter day doorknobs is their religion you know and he's their patron saint yep yep it was totally fucking embarrassing a to a, an actual hatchet job an, an actual fucking hatchet job to be honest um it was deeply dishonest um <laughs> and again if that had been directed at like some establishment corporate republican or democrat then i don't give a fuck but we're talking about a progressive here who despite her you know, despite my disagreements with her, is trying to further the progressive movement, is trying to fight back against the neoliberalism of Joe Biden. Um, I, I just don't understand the point of treating this person like she's some sort of establishment stooge or like whatever disagreements we might have with her are somehow informed by like her allegiance to the establishment when clearly that doesn't exist. Um, so anyway, either way, thank you so much, Zachary. And shout out to you. Uh, Sadiq, I think that's how you pronounce your name for becoming a YouTube member. Really appreciate that, man. Yeah, shout out to you, Sadiq. That's awesome. We're getting, we're, we're moving on up, guys. Gavin and I want to get to 100 YouTube members, and then we're going to start rolling out some brand new member only content. We're talking about book clubs. We're talking about movie clubs. We're talking about the sports guard. Hello. If you want to see me say things to Gavin about sports and have him be like, oh, yeah regular people know about that <laughs> um and it does look like the maintenance guy might be here for a second so i'm gonna move my stuff upstairs uh and uh, let him in really quick yeah no problem at all no problem uh but yeah shout out to you sadiq thank you so much for becoming a youtube member as zach said we are in the process of creating some new perks and bonus kind of stuff for members as well as the patron community um so if you guys want access to all that stuff plus the emotes in the chat becoming a youtube member is a great way to support the show and like i said i want to add more emotes to chat but we can only add so many like 
per amount of members we have. So I think we just need like 10 more members and then I can add like six more emojis. So I'm going to add like an RFK emoji. I was thinking of like a Jank emoji, a Jimmy emoji, a Vosh emoji, you know, all the, all the regular, uh, you know, all the usual suspects of the Vanguard. Um, but anyway, shout out to you, Sadiq. Enjoy access to those emotes and some of the, you know, exclusive material that you're going to get access to. A couple more super chats to quickly get through. Did you decide to just stay put, Zach? Oh, yeah, I think it'll be fine. Nice, nice. Um, but yeah, shout out to you. And thank you so much, Jack, for the nine ninety nine unrelated. But what do you think would happen if Jank and Jimmy Dore saw each other at the airport? <laughs> LOL. I mean, honestly, they'd probably just awkwardly make eye contact and keep walking. I kind of doubt there would be like some altercation breaking out. But I mean, we both we've, we've seen how Jank acts at the airport. Um, and we know that Jimmy Dore likes to yell at people for, you know, to bring him a martini or whatever. So clearly they both have the potential to uh, explode. Yeah, I just think it's more of a an act. I think it's more of a like something that you put on for the show. And then when the lights are off, it's more just like put on your sunglasses and put on your headphones and walk through the airport. Nobody likes being in the airport anyway. You know what I mean? I like traveling as much as the next guy, but being in the airport, it's terrible. Gavin, you and I have spent a decent amount of time in airports together. Um, I don't know. I feel like everybody's just tunnel visioned off to do exactly what they have to do. You know, yep. you don't really want to get in an interaction unless you're Jank, which obviously that was that one time where he screamed at that lady, which was really embarrassing. Um, but yeah. Yeah, and then posted it as if it made him look good. Dude, that was the single worst thing he's ever done, I think. I mean, seriously, this man, he just lost it and filmed himself screaming at a, like this innocent, like poor lady that was working at the counter for like Southwest or some shit. It was, it was ridiculous. Yeah. And he was like, he was like, the play was supposed to be here like 45 minutes ago. And he's like, screaming, like 45 minutes is not that long to have to wait. Like, that's a pretty common delay, bro. He's Dude. like, where's the fucking plane? <laughs> so Lisa had her plane canceled when she was in a layover uh, like six months ago. You know what I mean? They were like, oh, yeah, we sent your luggage, uh, but we actually didn't, you know, send. We're, we're not sending your airplane. So I like it, 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 people have all kinds of way, way, way worse insane horror stories, especially if you have to fly internationally. Jeez. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to picture Salisa going full Jank Uger on some poor airport. Yeah, staff. five two <laughs> Filipino woman just screaming at the uh, um, screaming at the help desk. Honestly, I'd like to see that a little bit more. <laughs> Where's the fucking plane? <laughs> anyway, shout out to you guys for the super chats. Um, we are going to get into our main story. Do you want to start with the the next uh, chapter in the Jank versus TYT drama, Zach, or do you want to start with this breaking point segment? Ken Klippenstein versus Sagar and Jetty. Well, it's interesting. I know I'm going to trigger the fuck out of Gavin with my analysis over this alien, uh, uh, alien uh, thing going down with a. Uh, I because I, I honestly, guys, I'm I'm honestly I'm I'm going with Kung Fu Kenny on this one. Uh, but uh, I know Gavin. He's a big believer. He's a he's a he's he's crossing his fingers. You know, putting an ice cube under his pillow at night, just praying for aliens to be legit. Um, no, uh, it, we can honestly. I think the Vosh story will be uh, quicker, so we can go ahead and get into that guy, and then we'll get into the aliens. Okay, cool. Yeah, I uh, can't wait to hear you defend the deep state's mouthpiece in a second. Um, just kidding, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> the, the deep state's favorite reporter. Yeah. Um, also, speaking of, shout out to you, Kevin. Reports of an alien attack in Peru. This show is just going to slowly become a fucking UFO show if if you guys let it. Um, Peruvian tribe claims it was attacked by seven foot aliens. This is from the Jerusalem Post. That's a that's a reputable outlet. I'm gonna guess. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. That, uh, I think they're one of the bigger uh, publications in Israel. Yeah, Peruvian villagers have said they faced attacks by aliens. Local media reported the tribe members have begun nightly patrols in order to protect the vulnerable members of their community, including women, children, and the elderly interesting i'll have to do more research into this one we do have some stuff to get into kevin and a limited amount of time to record today so I, unfortunately we can't do a deep dive on this right now um but thanks for letting me know yeah we'll put this in our back pocket because I, I i'm i'm gonna put i'm gonna put the over on uh the bet that gavin's like yeah i think this is legit <laughs> exactly what reason do these tribes people have to lie i mean come on the deep uh, state on <laughs> the other hand <laughs> Uh, it's probably just like their like psychological way to deal with the reality of like encroaching fucking industry and settlers and stuff, you know, so that like they see these like fucking forest, you know, industry and they're like, it's aliens. Or, I don't know. That's infantile. Yeah, Gavin, these 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 uh, fucking <laughs> tribes, people in the wilderness, they have to explain away industrialization. <laughs> I hear you, man. I hear you. <laughs> Unlike these rational Westerners. who. <laughs> No, I'm sure they're. Uh, I believe them. Anyway, let's get into this. <laughs> let's get into this, guys. We had some uh, more TYT 
Vosh drama. We've been talking about this for a couple of days now. Um, I have to switch over to the screen fans Twitter to show you guys what's going on. Cause as you all know, Anna blocked us on Twitter. Um, so I got to go over here. Uh, oops. And there went the link. Um, so let me reload that page real quick so I can show you guys some of the latest escalating attacks on Vosh coming from Anna Kasperi. And here's a good one for you guys. Um, this, this is might be you... the funnest. What was that, Zach? Oh, yeah, just just reminding everybody this is a DIY home broadcast, guys. <laughs> this is this is the authenticity that you signed up for. <laughs> right. Um, so here we go. Someone posted this. And this is a point a lot of people, ourselves included, were making, being like, uh, you know, you were just talking to Ben Shapiro, not just talking to him, but having a polite conversation with Ben Shapiro where you were talking about like, oh, I think you're actually one of the more reasonable people on the right wing. And, you know, just like how you're one of the more reasonable people on the right wing. I'm one of the more reasonable people on the left wing. I, I'm not with these crazy lefties, these radical police abolitionists and trans activists. No, I'm one of the sane lefties one of the silent uh majority you know what i'm saying uh so a lot of people were pointing this which out which is an actual talk. reagan slogan in case anybody was curious right right um so yeah a lot of people were pointing that out uh you're garbage vosh i don't respect you which is why i don't want to talk to you meanwhile she talks to ben shapiro quite politely in a very civil way um so anna responded to this and she says unlike vosh shapiro never once called me retarded or a bitch over disagreements that's how big boys who don't snort addies during unhinged streams act i don't owe anyone a conversation or debate but i especially have no interest in antisocial creeps like vosh simple um vosh responded to this with an absolute banger oh my god get ready guys he says anna is ter it anna is now insinuating i'm a drug addict presumably because she's so terrified of me that in her mind i'm beginning to take the form of the thing she fears most a homeless person. Mic drop. Mic drop. Oh my god, that was fucking hilarious. I saw this last night and I almost spit out my beer, bro. I was like, oh, this is so funny because it's so true. Look, Anna is so sensitive. She's just like, it's all about, it's not about any kind of political analysis for her. It's not about any like broader movement, right? She's, you know, she's out here, you know, sticking her finger into whatever, like, uh, oh, this person's nice to me. Well, then I guess their politics are good. Meanwhile, she's uh, having their politics rub off on her, right? The Ben Shapiro anti-homeless brigade, right? Blaming people who are deeply impoverished for uh, situations that they did not account for, rising rents, uh, you know, extreme policing, all this kind of bullshit, right? So, it, yeah, uh, she's gone full LA liberal, unfortunately, like just like not in my backyard, uh, you know, whatever. And now because Vosh has called her out for it, and honestly, Vosh, she does use brash language. She's gotten in trouble for that before, but I, I never really thought much of it because he kind of, talked about that every way like we have a like a decent you know professional relationship with vosh and he still will call us like fucking retarded or whatever i'm like this is just the way he get, he rolls he's just like right. a, a little bit like that's just how he talks or whatever uh so i think she took it extremely personally but oh my gosh way to just wrap this up with a bow on it and say see you later bro like this uh this this beef has been uh you know dealt with Right, right. And again, I have to go back to the fact that Anna was seemingly 100% cool with Vosh before Vosh started criticizing her. So I, I just don't love this pearl clutching over his use of naughty language, right? It's okay if you like tune into Vosh and you're like, you know, this isn't really for me. I don't like watching streamers who use words like bitch or retard. Like, that's just not really for me. I understand that. You know, Vosh is not for everyone. But clearly, Vosh was for Anna like six months ago. That's when she went on his program um, just before he, you know, started criticizing her for some of her recent comments. But seemingly, she had no problem with his candor, with his rude comments and, you know, use of naughty language, right? Um, and I get it. You know, it hurts when people call you mean things for sure. But I'm just saying, bro, Vosh called us a fucking fascist the day before we debated him, and it was still a perfectly civil conversation. Now I get it. I'm a dude. Vosh is a dude. It's not quite the same thing as being called a bitch by a man if you're a woman. So I know that it's like a slightly different thing. But it's but... not really, though. To me, like, this is where I'll draw the line, right? Is that we're on a website called YouTube right now, and we're all fucking fortunate enough to where we have an audience that does this shit. They have a way bigger audience than we have. I mean, both of them are more like Beverly Hills cats. We're more Kansas City, Missouri cats. But um, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, I'm sorry that you fucking do a broadcast for thousands and thousands of people. 
and then somebody said something mean about yeah. you. Like that's literally the name of the game in this industry. You are making a show on YouTube. Other people are going to react to your show and they're going to decide to either praise it or they're going to decide to talk shit. It's just like that's the way the world works. That's what you signed up for when you decided to turn on your webcam and put your thoughts out into the world. And I just think it's so ridiculous when people try and pretend that it's like, oh, it's so offensive when somebody just has like a candid conversation about how, yeah, you put out a take that I thought was fucking stupid, right? Like you, you know, are, um, you know, it, it, it's just, it's ridiculous. Right, right, totally. Um, and Anna responded not to Vosh, but to someone else who was um, responding to that that tweet from her, basically being like, you know, I, I, of course I'll talk to Ben Shapiro and not Vosh. He called, you know, Ben Shapiro didn't call me a bitch and a retard. Vosh did. Of course I'll talk to Ben and not Vosh. Um, so someone says, LOL, all you have to do is, all someone has to do is stroke your ego and you'll work with them. That's what you're saying. To which Anna responded, that's fucking right. I guess she's being honest, I guess. Like, I don't really know what to make of this, if she's just trolling or if, if that's actually her stance. But I, mean, yeah, I think she's trying to troll, but she's just giving away her hand because that's obviously the way that it works, right? It's like, kiss the ring and then you can, you know, have my presence on your show. You, you know, I'll fawn over you. I'll pretend that you're like a serious, you know, kind, gentle person because then we can, you know, mutually benefit off of it like you know it's, if especially if it's a guy with a massive platform like ben shapiro like ben shapiro is like the fucking scum of the earth guys i mean he is literally nefarious and uh he supports literally everything that will destroy our entire uh, hardcore um austerity you know tax cuts for the rich uh you know no minimum wage laws like you know your workplace can exploit you uh that's all the st stuff that he supports on top of like hating gay people and like loving the police and all that kind of shit you know what i'm saying Yep. Um, but if you're nice to Anna Kasparian, she's willing to set all of that aside. What she's not willing to set aside is the fact that somebody was like a little grouchy with her uh, in their live stream when she was making terrible, terrible points to an audience of thousands and thousands of people. It's like it's ridiculous. Yep, yep. Um, so that that was pretty funny. We also got some comments from Jank on Twitter that I thought were equally humorous. He says, "Online grifter grifter manual one: Attack the Young Turks for something obviously ridiculously wrong, like we're right wingers or establishment shills. Two: Personally insult one of our hosts to make sure you got our attention. Three: Pretend to be the victim. Four: Say you're more pure in whatever political faction you're pretending to be in. Five: Try to siphon off as much audience for yourself as possible after getting into our algorithm loop or getting us to respond. Six, become flavor of the week. Seven, go back to having 37 followers. <laughs> Eight, tell war stories about how for one week you got to fight the young Turks. I feel like Jank thinks that Vosh is like some tiny streamer with like 20k subs like us. He thinks they're <laughs> us. Yeah. 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 And <laughs> like, bro, Vosh gets just as much attention and views as you he's arguably just as big of a channel or a presence on this in this space as you guys if not even a little bit more relevant to be honest you guys are just more legacy that's why you have like you know 10 times as many subs as vosh but you don't get any more views than he does um so i think that's pretty fucking funny oh dude it's hilarious and also uh vosh comes in with an absolute banger oh hold on one second for me Gavin. oh you're good uh oh gotcha yeah, Vosh responds and says, on the lookout for these guys, sir, <laughs> which was hilarious. Um, did did you want to jump in, Zach, or do you have to? Oh, yeah, I just thought that that was so fucking funny. And like, yeah, it, it is ridiculous because Jake is so out of touch at this point. You can tell that he's like entering that like stage in life where he's in his 50s. You know, he's not really keeping up with what everybody's talking about anymore. And he's relying on the fact that he did amass a ginormous audience at one point 20 years ago. And honestly, they probably peaked in their audience size in like 2016. So what's that? Seven, you know, maybe six, seven years ago. And ever since then, dude, he's just been so out of touch. He's been unable to recreate any kind of energy over there because I just think that you know, they always say, like, it's a young man's game for a reason. Like, he just doesn't have his finger on the pulse anymore. He doesn't understand what the audience wants anymore. And he thinks that the it, like he thinks that the legacy is uh, of, of TYT is going to carry them when in reality, it's just further and further eroding uh, any potential that they have a kind of scooping up a new audience. Right. That's why all their videos, they, you know, 50, 60,000 views max. Right. Uh, you know, they don't have video clips that are going 800K views. They don't have the 500K views. And Vosh has that all the time. Vosh was debating us who are like practically nobodies. We barely do this professionally. And he, I mean, it had 100,000 uh, fucking views in like 
eight hours. It was insane, you know? So anyway. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so that that's pretty funny stuff. That is definitely pretty fucking hilarious. Got another one from Jink, who, yeah, just seems to completely be out of the loop on a lot of this drama. Um, it seems like he's just defending Anna because that's what he knows how to do and that's what he's like instinct but i don't really think he knows anything about vosh which is leading to a lot of hilarious attempted attacks like this one to this day i don't know what this vosh guy is or which side he's pretending to be on these days you can literally just like do some basic homework to figure it out like vosh has been around for years now it's not that hard like, who the fuck is this vosh character that i keep hearing about like you can just watch a video and find out jink um literally i do know he appears to be one of the largest hypocrites online. He does the usual thing of attacking us and then pretends to be wounded afterward. And then this. And he's responding to some person trying to hypocrisy burn Vosh for saying that Anna was palling around with Ben Shapiro and then posting this picture of, J of Vosh supposedly palling around with Tim Pool um, and, and Charlie Kirk. Uh, when in reality, this photo was taken minutes after one of the most intense and aggressive debates that I've seen from Vosh, one that he actually did really well in, by the way, um, like way better than Anna did against Ben Shapiro. So, just yeah, saying. it's crazy because this is like the equivalent of like shaking somebody's hand after you've just had like a brutal bout with them. Right. It's like I it's kind of the tactful thing to do. Right. Like, hey, like we're still human beings. Like I just tried to rip your fucking throat out for three hours uh, debating every single thing you believe. Like, let's take a picture afterwards and then we can both all promote this to our respective audiences and be like, LOL. And honestly, if you look at the way that Vosh is posing here, it's kind of clear what's like the context of what's going on. He's just like, I just I just alpha these guys like I'm, I'm pretty happy with myself. <laughs> like, uh, you know what I mean? And again, it's like it's not like we don't have disagreements with Vosh, but to pretend that because he tried to go on Tim Pool's uh, show to debate Charlie Kirk or whatever, uh, and it, like that that somehow disqualifies him from ever hypocrisy burning you when you did the opposite of debate when you went on to the right wing fucking horseshit show on the Daily Wire. Uh, pretty pretty funny and, and a big fumble. And it's, I guess Anna went on the show. Jank never went on the Daily Wire. I would imagine Jank would be a little more fucking contentious with Ben Shapiro just because of the history that he has of trying to be the like aggressive, progressive guy in the room. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever followed this account, Zach, the Rivolino? Uh, no, but this is exactly <laughs> the kind of joke I was making. Who <laughs> looks more dominant. They always do that thing where they like post uh, pictures of dudes and photos. And like if your hands are over your crotch, it's cock shame. If your hands are like to the side, it's cock confidence. <laughs> so everyone was roasting this picture being like Tim Pool with the cock shame. Vosh with the cock confidence. See, that's why I always put both my hands behind my back and kind of lean back a little bit. You guys know what I'm, you know what I'm trying to uh, project to the world. <laughs> yeah, the green lines. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so uh, Jink responded to this. Let me try to get back to the original. I don't know if I uh, lost it. Let me go back to the OG post real quick. Vosh said, Jink, I love you, but you literally have no idea what's going on. <laughs> But that's okay. We cool. So Vosh clearly wants to debate Jank, um, which I think would actually be a lot better of a conversation, to be honest. Clearly, Anna's just so like in her feelings about this whole situation that I don't even think it's possible for her to have like a, just an objective debate on whatever fucking disagreement she has with people, whether it's the birthing person crap or anything else. Like she's just, it's too personal for her at this point. I do think that a conversation between Jank and Vosh would probably be more productive and probably a little bit uh, like more better content for us to read. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there would definitely be some like drama with Anna. Cause she would be like, you called me a bitch or whatever, but I do think it would be a better conversation with Jank and Vosh. Hopefully that happens. Yeah, we know what Vosh does every time he uh, goes on to debate somebody like that. He does his good boy routine where he like, you know, sits back. He's got his hair pulled back and he's like, oh, it's absolutely my pleasure to be invited onto your program. I'm so excited to have a pleasant discussion with you today. And like, you know, just kind of like really tries to like ham it up that like, oh, I'm just like, you know, uh, what's the. <laughs> Uh, what's that guy's name? He does the old uh, Eddie Haskell move from uh, Leave It to Beaver. You know the the, the what's it? Wally's friend uh, Eddie Haskell. That's a really antiquated reference, but the real ones, <laughs> the boomers in our chat, will know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, one more from Anna too. She posted this hilariously on Twitter. As we suspected, the blackmail that she was threatening against Vosh was just this clip that everyone has already seen. Like, bro, everyone knows that this clip is out here. Uh, 
like this is not some damning piece of blackmail that you thought it was. I'm sorry, but this is fucking pathetic. Um, this is so weak. Yeah, we can go ahead and play the community online, particularly the LGBT community, is cancerous as fuck. If you're not an idiot, you will agree with me on this. <laughs> if you have any fucking experience with online like LGBT or leftist discourse, you know it's cancerous as fuck. You understand this. People are hyper fragile. There's a ton, a ton of mental illness. And these you can't convert these people. They're not reasonable. They have to be excised from the left. Unity online, particularly the where is the lie, Gavin? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> LOL. Um, yeah, I saw a funny tweet uh, about that actually, but from Shu, I'll try to find it real quick. Um, I probably won't be able to find Oh, yeah, she's like progressives fighting on here, like this you, this you posting their only good takes at each other. That was kind of funny, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> But yeah, clearly Vosh was joking. Clearly he was being edgy. I'm sorry. And everyone knows about that clip. Everyone's already seen that clip. Posting that clip is not going to make anyone who already likes Vosh start disliking him, right? Like, that's kind of the appeal of Vosh. I'm sorry. I was going to say, that's the whole crux of his show is that he's like a, you know... Uh, <laughs> like an, like he himself is like an LGBTQ person, but he wants to go out there. Like, and honestly, what he was referencing, guys, was the like really like the really low time, the low point for the online left sphere. You guys remember when Tumblr took over maybe a decade ago, and it was just it was real rough out here for the online left. Everybody was talking about like, oh, this is my point of personal privilege. It was like it was annoying as fuck. We had to we had to clear that up a little bit, and so obviously he was using that to like inform his jokes. But like, I, I feel like what's underrated about Vosh and the thing. That that I like most about the guys that I think he's fucking funny and like you can win me over if you're just funny like we could disagree on a lot of shit but if you're fucking hilarious bro it's hard to hate you that is such a good point bro that is such a good point some people if they have a certain level of confidence and like a comedic ability about them like they can just get away with saying things that other people can't um like an but... RFKJ impression yeah <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah ultimately though I, I just don't understand why this all had to get so fucking personal like Vosh has always been aggressive. He's always been edgy. I don't understand why Anna thought she was going to receive different treatments or like somehow he would put on the kid gloves for her. I don't know why she couldn't have just gone on his show and argued about why she thinks birthing person is the worst thing in the world and why she's basing her entire political ideology on the fact that some progressive activists like that term and that she doesn't and that they were mean to her on Twitter. Like, it, it could have just been a 30 minute conversation and then everyone would have forgotten about it. Um, but instead, Anna had to melt down and act like because of the fact that fellow progressives were disagreeing with her, that somehow she was like the victim of a fucking like like witch hunt or something. Um, and, and that people were being so, so mean to her, even though the examples that she cited were Vosh being mean to her, which obviously, yeah, he was. That's who he is. He's mean to everyone he disagrees with. Um, but then it was like, okay, I get it. Vosh was mean to you. There's no denying that he said not mean things about you. He used nasty words. So maybe if you wanted to just be mad at Vosh, I would get it. But did Lance from the surfs call her a bitch or a retard or was he mean? And no, Lance was like super fucking nice. He was super reasonable, incredibly polite, offered some pushback from the place of a friend and a colleague. And you still threw him under the bus, called him like a fucking crazy person and a clown and all this crazy stuff. Same with Mike Figueredo. Mike also was very polite, you know, tried to engage, tried to push back. You were a dick to him as well. Um, same with Olay. Uh, like there's all these progressives who didn't call you a bitch, who didn't call you a retard, who didn't, you know, say mean and nasty things about you and just politely disagreed with you. And that was also too much. Right. So like, I get not wanting to be called a bitch or a retard. I can understand having like an emotional negative reaction to that and, and being like, you know, this person's not even applying any sort of charitability to me. So fuck them. I'm, you know, I hate them. I, can at least understand that. Um, but again, it's not like she just got mad at Vosh. She got mad at plenty of reasonable critics of her take from the left, people like Lance, people like Mike, people like Olay, who were not being mean, who were not being rude, beyond maybe just a little bit of comedic, like, you know, like uh, roasting, but nothing serious, nothing like genuinely mean. So I just don't understand why she took this so personally and why she's got so bent out of shape over something so stupid, which is literally the term birthing person. Like who fucking cares, bro? Ima like I was just thinking the other day, like imagine if there was a fucking vasectomy clinic, right? 
you know, I was thinking about getting a vasectomy. I was like, well, if I have to go to a vasectomy clinic, they might say this is a, a clinic for people who have the ability to ejaculate or whatever. Like, because some people might go in there that are like trans Male women. erasure. <laughs> right. Like maybe a fucking, maybe a fucking uh, non-binary person goes in there because they want to get a vasectomy. Maybe a trans woman wants a vasectomy. Like it's not just for cis men. So would I in any way be offended if I went to go get a vasectomy and they and there's a form that I had to fill out that says, are you someone that has the ability to ejaculate? Like, obviously, no, in no way would that threaten my masculinity. In no way would that offend me. Um, so I just don't get it. I, I, I in no way can imagine starting a fucking whole like war with all of my friends and colleagues and people that I trust over the fact that I didn't want to be called an inseminating person. Exactly, Rick. Uh, I just think it's crazy. Yeah, it is pretty ridiculous. Um, and also, I mean, on top of that, you have the whole homelessness thing, the crime thing, you know, the drug war thing, all of the, oh, sorry, guys, actually, Portugal was wrong to legalize their drugs. It's creating more crime. Ah, no, absolutely crazy. Also, guys, if you if I seem a little distant, it's because I have to wonder what the man that is helping me fix my dishwasher thinks about the fucking Vanguard out of context, just only hearing my contributions to the show. And I'm <laughs> like, I know he's trying to pretend like he's not listening. I'm trying to pretend like he's not listening. But you guys have to know that this is that this is additional context for me today while I'm waiting on my desk uh, that's going to go upstairs to get here and I'm <laughs> recording from my kitchen. <laughs> yeah, good thing he wasn't privy to the ejaculation discourse. Um, luckily your headphones are in, so he probably didn't hear about all of that. Um, <laughs> hopefully he's a based comrade though. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, he's a, he's, he's based, he's fixing my dishwasher. Cause I was like, I do not want to keep washing these dishes by hand. Um, That's but anyway, fair. what I've been super excited to get into. Oh, wait, since we have, we have oh. one more piece of the, the Vosh Anna thing. Yeah. There's a video Vosh put out that I wanted to react to just like five or 10 minutes of. So let's do that and then move on to the breaking points thing. If that's cool with you guys, um, Vosh put this out the other day. Had some juicy details in it, so I figured we'd quickly give this a bit of a react. With no lead up, Anna Kasparian is so mad, it's unbelievable. It's actually one of the maddest I've ever seen a person be about me. So Thana, respected mod, site mod, yeah, yeah. Um, Thana uh, 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 posted this, <clears throat> essentially saying, you know, Anna Kasparian won't talk to Vosh. Okay, so to be clear, by the way, I'm not incessantly challenging Anna Kasparian to a debate. She's too cowardly to talk to me. She never will. I, I, I know that. I'm not, like, I know it would be pointless to go on and on about it, but she's really insecure about the fact that she won't debate me. So anyway, Thana um, posted like, well, she's willing to talk to Ben Shapiro. And Kasparian responded with this. And if this doesn't make it into a copy pasta, okay, then I'm genuinely disappointed with you people because look at this. Unlike Vosh, Shapiro never once called me parted or a chivalry disagreement, uh, disagreements. That's how big boys who don't snort Addies during unhinged streams act. I don't know anyone at conversation or debate, but I especially have no interest in antisocial creeps like Vosh. Simple. And it's so good on so many levels because she's like cycling through every insult she can think of, right? And okay, oh, <laughs> because I tweeted this, but I think Anna Kasparian is so uh, afraid of me that I. That and reacts on the thing she despises and fears the most a homeless person. So she has to insinuate I'm a drug addict. So, like, my 10 milligram Adderall prescription, which is, like, the lowest dose you give adults. And, and she's like, this druggie, this, mm, if I was, if I was in Santa Monica, he would be curled up in an alleyway. Dude, do you want me to try playing it? Like, she's trying, it's just so much projection, you know? It's really, 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 really good. And then uh, somebody said, lol, all you have, all somebody has to do is stroke your ego and you'll work for them. That's what you're saying. And Annika Sperian says, that's right which I feel should be completely disqualifying for like any legitimacy as a commentator. Like she's just openly admitting. Like in her mind, I'm morphing into the thing she despises and fears the most, a homeless person. So she has to insinuate I'm a drug addict. So like my 10 milligram Adderall prescription, which is like the lowest dose you give adults. And, and she's like, this druggie, this, mm, if, I was, if I was in Santa Monica, he would be curled up in an alleyway. I have to, like, it's, it's, like she's, it's just, so much projection, you know? 
It's really, 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 really good. And then uh, somebody said, Lol, all you have, all somebody has to do is stroke your ego and you'll work for them. That's what you're saying. And Annika Sperian says, that's right, which I feel should be completely disqualifying for like any legitimacy as a commentator. Like she's just openly admitting like this is literally the Karen or Carolyn Borisenko thing where I was a, a, a devout liberal, but then I went to a Trump rally and the Trumpers were nice to me and it was different from the time the lefties were mean to me. So now I'm on the right. The funny thing is, in terms of behavior, she's actually acting closest to Dave Rubin right now. I don't know if you guys remember it, because a lot of Dave Rubin's career arc was before I took off as a streamer. But Dave Rubin's whole thing was, hey, I'm a liberal who just wants to have conversations across the aisle. And then it was, man, the left sure doesn't like it when I have like Nazis and white nationalists on. They're so mean to me. But these white nationalists are nice to me. So I'm going to have them on. And then it was, why is the left so rude to me when I have conversations with the far right? You know, and then like, this is why I'm leaving the left. Dave Rubin was the poster child for the joke of why I'm leaving the left. He's the guy, like he's the person fr from whom like the template of that joke is. And what's crazy is that no, absolutely nobody, absolutely nobody would be coming after Anna like this if she'd gone on Ben Shapiro's show and if they'd actually fucking sparred with one another, right? Like, I'm not saying that Anna has to change her demeanor. Some people are not the kind of individuals that like to, um, you know, debate all hot and heavy like that, you know, get really caustic. Like, you know, I could see us at some point, like getting into a really he heated debate with Vosh and then just kind of moving on and being like, whatever, like that was no big deal. Uh, that's sometimes how debates goes. Whereas like, I, I, I don't expect that from Anna, but what I do expect is for her to be like, oh, that's a conservative talking point. Like, this is actually what I believe. I heard you say that, like actually debate them, actually talk about the areas of where you disagree. Because yeah, one thing that, um, you know, Vosh actually talks about that I think is important because he's debated a lot of the worst of the worst worst fucking people and basically and, and a lot of any exposure that i have to like white nationalist talking points is like because Vosh has debated these people and you get to hear their like craziness but uh you know one point that he makes often is that they try really hard to be nice to you because they don't hate you because of your identity right they don't hate anna kasparian they want her to, to see her as a trad wom you know what i mean a, a a literal like you know like that's what they want to see her as and they're like oh yeah these people have you know poisoned you and manipulated you and like come back over here yes you should be afraid of these criminals yes you should be afraid of this yes 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 because she's just indulging them of course they're being nice to you that's how they recruit bro that's how they recruit and so it's just like you want to lecture other people about how to do politics when you can't even see the most transparent effort to bring you to the right wing and coax you to the right wing. And then you're going to retaliate to the left because they're calling you out for it. It, it makes no sense. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. It, it's, it's fucking crazy. And I really think that they could have had a decent debate too. And this whole could have, this whole fucking drama could have just been avoided if she wasn't so terrified to disengage and like Vosh is actually like, yeah, he does have this reputation for being an aggressive asshole and stuff. But I've watched plenty of debates where people disagree with Vosh and he actually like gives them all the charitability, lets them explain their points. He's not rude. Like he will say all kinds of horrible shit about you off screen, like when you're not there. But then he will have a good conversation with you. And, and maybe, you know, some people don't like that. And they're like, you know, you're a pussy. Say it to my face. Like, I don't want you to fucking be mean to me behind my back and then nice to me to my face. But like, you kind of just have to accept that that's who he is. Like, he's always going to roast people. He's always going to be kind of a caustic asshole when he's trying to destroy people's arguments. But then if you want to, you know, come and face the guy, he'll be nice to you. Like, it's not that hard. He, Crystal and Kyle did it. They debated him. We've done it. Uh, lots of people, almost everyone's debated fucking Vosh. You can't, you can't handle it, Anna. Come on. That's the other thing. It's like, what, what are you running from? Why are you not doing more? Fine, you want to be the one person that debates the left, but it, it's not even that. You're not even out here debating the left on these points. You're afraid right. to debate the left for these points. You just want to finger wag at them and then run to the right. That is the problem here. That's why I have no respect for Anna's position here. Totally. You know? So she's just doing that now. She's literally just saying, like, well, if you're nice to me and you stroke my ego, then, like, I'll talk to you and we're good. And not if not. Have you tried calling her a bitch nicely? I feel like I've called her that with, like, a range of tones. So probably, yeah. Check this out from half an hour ago. Yeah. So in the, in the ongoing effort to throw darts at a board, in response to me making fun of her in the fashion that I just repeated here, Anna's now insinuating my drug addict, presumably because she's so terrified of me that in her mind I begin to take a form of things she fears most a homeless person. Her response was, hey, Vosh this you <laughs> no i don't know what what clip is this i don't know i don't know what this is who is this <laughs> I, I i have i i have no idea <laughs>
uh, who? who? What, what, a, what a handsome chap. You know, I think he'd look great if he lost like 60, 70, 80, 90 pounds. <laughs> um i you know i think he'd look great and maybe if he changed up the hair a little bit i don't know who this is you pause it for a isn't this from the, that nazi guy yes this is the clip this is also just hilarious because it's like like anna and jank think they got vosh so hard they really embarrassed him and here he is just like having a fucking field day with this material you just gave him exactly what he wanted you just gave him that relevance boost you just gave him material and content to react to for fucking days like you really just should have ignored him also Anna. if you if you really just like don't like him and hate him that's the thing people always think like oh i fucking hate this guy i'm gonna fucking destroy him and then they just end up drawing way more attention to them and making themselves look stupid in the process um it's it's crazy yeah uh anyway this <laughs> i just think it's hilarious that she acted like she had such a smoking gun uh and then it was just this video clip that everybody had also had already researched. That's what I said in the video the other day. I was like, when are we going to see something that didn't already come up when ContraPoint's audience went after Vosh? That is some of the most terminally online audience that you can fucking find on this internet. And also, she's huge on YouTube. So everybody's going to be out trying to ruin Vosh. Like, you know, uh, this is the best you've got. I mean, it's, it's fucking hilarious, right? Like the dude's literally laughing it off because he knows it's a joke. He knows his whole audience thinks it's a joke. And they all kind of like vaguely like know what he's talking about. Like the deeply like fucking like I'm um, trying to outwoke everybody else's wokeness that happened in like 2014 and 2015 before Bernie Sanders gave the left literally anything positive to focus on. Right. Anyway, I think we basically got the point, guys. Um, this has been fun. Hopefully it continues. But yeah, I think we've probably exhausted the Vosh v. Anna and Jink story for today. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And this this leaves us plenty of time to get into uh, the debate, the contentious debate, dude. And I love this because, I, you know, obviously Ken Klippenstein and the folks in, at Breaking Point have a good relationship. And this just shows that even in the, in the big leagues, you can have like a contentious discussion with people that you disagree with and it could be respectful and it could be, you know, and this is the kind of disagreement that I could imagine myself and Gavin having if we were to sit down and like really debate the UFO issue. Uh, you know what I mean? And then uh, so anyway, I watched this. I immediately thought of Gavin and put it in the folder because I was like, this is something we have to discuss on the show. Yeah, yeah. Super excited to get into this one. I also watched this on Breaking Points yesterday and was riveted by the conversation. I was not expecting it to get so spicy. Um, but yeah, we've been talking a little bit about the UFO stuff here at the Vanguard. I know that, you know, Zach is a little more skeptical. Um, I'm usually the one that plays the role of the believer. Uh, but yesterday, Ken Klippenstein posted this report on The Intercept called UFO Whistleblower Kept Security Clearance After Psychiatric Detention. And basically through a FOIA request, Ken Klippenstein found out that David Grush, who's the UFO whistleblower, basically has had some like alcohol issues and a few like sort of psychotic episodes. At one point, he was suicidal, seemingly as a result of PTSD from serving in Afghanistan. That also likely inspired his... Uh, bouts with alcoholism it's unclear if dave grush still struggles with alcoholism or if he's sober now um, but either way that's a little bit of the context sagar was not very pleased with kin's report here and it's about to you know kind of result in a bit of a debate a little bit of a contentious back and forth yeah, and uh, shout out to Ken for coming on and defending his reporting, right? A lot of times reporters will be like, this is my reporting. You can't poke any holes in it that tells me what I did was against the law. Like, get fucked. I stand by my reporting. No, Ken is willing to come out here, sit across the table from somebody like Sagar who vehemently disagrees with him and say, no, I'm willing to I'm willing to defend it and stand by my reporting. And I'm willing to answer any questions that anyone has about the context. And for what it's worth, Ken, <laughs> he's been taking some shit from the UFO community about this. I saw him uh, tweet out a a uh, little screenshot from the r slash ufo subreddit and it was like do not fucking heckle or hassle ken Cliftonstein at his house i saw his address floating around on reddit and he was like jesus christ like <laughs> you know oh my so anyway God. we'll get into all that and, did, you and also, I do feel did you also see him trolling everyone saying that the intercept let him go oh no i didn't see that that but it's fucking hilarious because they were all calling for the intercept to fire him yeah, dude, he <laughs> he posted this tweet the other day being like the intercept let me go after all of this controversy. Um, they were he was totally joking, but then fucking News Nation actually ran with it and did his whole segment being like, see the fucking the 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 guy who exposed David Grush has been fired. <laughs> So that was funny. Um, also, Ken is a legendary uh, internet troller. If anybody doesn't know that, he's got some famous uh, famous trolls. Uh, you could look back on his cat.
Yep. Also, something I recently realized is that whoever the fuck owns News Nation is like apparently obsessed with aliens because News the company that owns News Nation also owns The Hills Rising. And if you guys haven't fucking noticed, The Hills Rising does like five UFO segments a day, like constantly. And News Nation also is like obsessed with the UFO and David Grush stuff. That's where David Grush, I think, premiered his like exclusive tell all interview and all this stuff so i think it's like next star media or something i want to say that owns these companies but whoever fuck right. is in control is like a ufoologist over there uh they should hit me up i'll i'll, I'll you know do some segments for you guys <laughs> just kidding but anyway yeah, been, and i will do the um you know that the cap on cap podcast gavin where it's his tinfoil cap i'll wear my baseball cap and we'll argue about fucking alien that would be amazing. Oh my god. <laughs> anyway, uh, we can get back to this with all of that out of the way. Um, let's take a look. Are flying as journalist Ken Clippenstein has published a new report for the intercept saying UFO whistleblower Dave Grush, who recently testified before the House Oversight Committee, was at one point referred to a mental health institution following two 911 calls from his wife in what Grush says is a PTSD related alcoholic incident. Grush and his associates initially accused the intelligence community of leaking non public health records to Clippenstein, who has since revealed he in fact retained access to this information by Freedom of Information Act requests, resulting dramas got both sides they're accusing the other of not telling the truth to the public about the situation so we've got ken clippy see himself in the studio now join us defending his story it's good to see you ken thanks hey. for joining us thanks for coming in ken great to be back with you guys all right ken so uh let's get into the nitty-gritty i guess of the story itself uh let's start broad strokes what is the story about what is it well so he's kind of the star witness of the um you know subcommittee that's looking at the um, ufo allegations not just him but there are two uh, pilots as well and so in the reporting on it, I noticed a phrase popping up again and again, a decorated war hero, a decorated mm -hmm. war hero, a decorated war hero. And I'm not disputing that he is, mm -hmm. but when I hear that, it's kind of like, okay, well, wh where's, the, where's the critique? Like, where's mm -hmm. the negative side or where's the like, vetting? And I didn't see any of that by any of the media. So I thought, well, I'm going to go and look and see what I can find. And so I know people both in DOD and the intelligence community. And I did a call for tips to try to broaden yes. the picture. It really just came from a mosaic of different sources that give me ideas of what was going on. We can talk about that more, but um, really my motive was just, it didn't feel like anybody was vetting this guy. Mm. See, Gavin? Yeah. Like a rational in individual to me right here. Wow. I'm, I'm just saying, if we're going off of, uh, off of w w who said what, uh, I don't know, Ken Klippenstein, long career as a, as a credentialed journalist, broken some pretty big stories. I don't know. I don't know. What say you, Gavin? Does this seem like the kind of guy that would mislead the public? No, no, I don't think anyone is claiming that Ken has misled the public at all. Like, he clearly just published facts that are available to the public via FOIA requests. So I don't think that's really the issue here. Um, and, and to be fair, I don't think that Ken did anything wrong, like morally. Like, this is information about this guy who is making extraordinary claims. I am happy to know more about him. Like, it's it's not really something that I view as, like... Uh, invasive or, or anything like that. Like if you're going to put yourself out there as this whistleblower who's making extraordinary claims, like, yeah, I think you should expect to have your history dug into a bit. Um, that doesn't seem like super out of bounds to me. Right now, what I will say is that I don't think it's quite the shocking breaking bombshell that some people are acting like it is that uh, a dude who served in Afghanistan and is a fucking decorated veteran has ptsd like that's not a shock to me at all I, I i would be more shocked if he didn't have ptsd i would be shocked if anyone that served in the like in, in conflict in in the military didn't have ptsd like i literally don't know how you couldn't um so that's not shocking to me like i could have told you that i could have told you that he had ptsd and probably struggled with alcoholism at some point in his life as a result that's you know the story of many vets unfortunately um so i, I think it's you know i, I, I don't think, think that downplays a little bit of what this guy was going through though you know what i mean like i mean the dude i mean his ex-wife said that he, he deeply like I'm, i mean like i'm just saying I, I we'll get into it a little bit more but i think that there's a huge effort to downplay how being an alcoholic and also like guys i've i've i am a bartender i've I, i've grown i've spent a lot of time around people who severely struggle with alcohol addiction i do not come at this from a way to vilify this man i do believe that it is a mental health thing and i do believe that this guy is entitled to and deserving of respect and treatment just like everyone else but here's what i will bring home and one of the things that really why i think this is it does matter 
is that it, it alcohol addiction is not it's usually something that you struggle with until you go into recovery. Uh, by and large, it's not something that you just put down. Uh, oh, I was an alcoholic for three months when I was going through something, and now I'm I'm a responsible drinker. Uh, and two, when you are, and, and I don't know if this guy's been in recovery, but I would imagine that that would have been something that would have come out where he says, hey, guys, I've been in recovery for four and a half years. Doesn't seem like that's the angle that they've gone with. It just says that at the time he was last hospitalized for struggling with alcohol addiction. And I, as somebody who have a lot of experience with alcoholics, no, it could be five, six years in between when you're hospitalized for your addiction and also and throughout all of that time still using. And I think that it, it, it creates extreme lapses in judgment which is where it becomes, you know, pertinent to the kind of claims that this guy's making. Uh, but I don't want to put the cart before the horse. Yeah, well, we're about to get into more of this. What I will say to that, Zach, is that if this guy was saying, if David Grush was saying, I saw aliens, I had a UFO sighting, you know, it was March 15th and it was a cloudy day and all of a sudden a UFO came out of the sky and beamed me up. At that point, I would say, yes, his alcoholism is incredibly relevant. He could have been shit faced drunk when that supposedly happened. We clearly have to factor this in. However, that's not his claim. He's not saying I saw an alien. He's a whistleblower saying I know information that the government is withholding from the public. And that's why I'm taking it public. Um, so like if it came out that like Edward Snowden was an alcoholic, like in no way would that be I would be like, oh, like, I don't know if we can trust this information now because this guy you know, like to drink whiskey. There is too way much. more ironclad evidence that the United States government was t uh, using meta extracting metadata. Obviously, from I'm just saying it's a little bit different. This is not some crank who said I got beamed up by a UFO in the cornfield. Like he's a whistleblower going through an official process. I don't really know what alcoholism has to do with that. Well, for one, as Ken will get into, uh, typically it, it could be grounds for removing your uh, access to those documents in the beginning. Uh, in the first place, uh, but we can we can play this out. Yeah. I, I think obviously Ken makes a better case than I will. So um, lay out those the specifics of the story and what you found through your FOIA request. So under the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, um, you can request police records. They're called called detail records, CADs, obscure things that aren't kind of like the typical police report that journalists tend to ask for. And maybe that's how they didn't know it existed. I have some practice with <laughs> forehead. Mm -hmm. I've been doing this a long time. So when I got these back, um, it was uh, two different incidents reported by his wife and previous wife um, in which uh, he had gone in the second case that was in 2018, I think. He had gone into a, uh, it's described as like an angry, drunken rage where he was um, suicidal, asked his wife to kill him. She uh, called police, said that uh, the guns were locked up. And then he was... Um, placed in a mental facility where after after he was um, assessed um, and then released, I think, a, a day later. Got it. And this happened 2014, 2018? Both. Yeah. Okay. So there's been a lot of back and forth. Uh, Grush accused you of getting these things leaked by the intelligence community. You revealed it came from the Freedom of Information Act. You did a Twitter space last night. You indicated you were tipped off by this. So were you tipped off by members of the intelligence community? It was both the Defense Department. I mean, again, it's a mosaic. You okay. talk to as many people as you can because you don't want to be dependent on any one individual who might have a grudge or whatever uh -huh. it is. But yes, I did talk to both DOD people and intelligence So people. in terms of the substance of the tip here, the accusation, I mean, aren't they fundamentally correct that like you are publishing dirt that was tipped to you by intelligence community? Um, well, the thing is, when I put out my call for tips, I said, if you have anything positive or negative, sure. because at the end of the day, like... I don't want to, you know, he's a human being. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, to be candid with you guys so people can account for where I'm coming from, I don't believe in the UFO stuff. I think yeah. he's incorrect about it. However, I don't want to just sec. punch at him. I would have included anything. So what do you think about that? Because I, I do think that's a little bit interesting. Ken admits to basically like taking some of this information, information from the Department of Defense, um, who it's pretty clear is trying to discredit David Grush. And you could, you know, speculate as to why. Um, but that is, that is why this uh, report, I think, is so controversial for a lot of people it's not just that he did a FOIA request it's that he was tipped off by the fucking government the department of defense who is in the process of trying to discredit david grush already which is another reason by the way that i, I totally disagree with people who say this is all a psyop like if, if this was a psyop then why would the government be trying to discredit this guy wouldn't they be like yeah totally there are aliens <laughs> better up the fucking defense budget to take care of that problem um but what do you think about that zach because i'm interested in your opinion do you think that this kind of makes him a like a mouthpiece of the deep state that maybe he should have passed on this report and let them you know let them give it to like cnn or some outlet that's more known as just a mouthpiece for dod hacks 
No, absolutely not. And I think that fundamentally misunderstands the kind of uh, role that Ken Klippenstein often plays in the uh, breaking of these kinds of news, right? Like, I, I don't know. I, I think a lot of people don't understand that many of the sources that Ken relies on when he's challenging the government all day long come from the same, you know, uh, workers that are in the DOJ, that they're working within the, uh, you know, the Virginia uh, military apparatus. These are the people that he has relationships with. These are the people that, uh, you know, he gets his tips off uh, from all the time when he's, uh, you know, reporting on the, the government and, you know, ways that are challenging them and their orthodoxies. And I think that Ken has a very long career. I mean, this is not a mouthpiece. This is a guy that came from the Young Turks. Uh, he was at The Nation and now he's at The Intercept, right? So I think to, you know, I, I ch accuse this guy of being like a you, like a useful idiot or, or like a mouthpiece and the, like say that he should have let this reporting go. I think it's, I think it's crazy because I think that he does have a lot of connections with these people and he's used it time and time again to do really uh, valued reporting, um, you know, uh, from again, from within the the deep state, from within the you know the Virginia D.C. apparatus, uh, and I think that when he got those tips uh, from the people, he did what every journalist is supposed to do. He said, "I'm going to do my own homework. I'm going to do my own vetting. I'm going to do my own verification." And he got the FOIA request, and he realized that yeah, this is something that is deserve to be checked out. And look, Ken comes at this from the perspective of somebody who is a skeptic. And he says that how come when I'm reading about this guy, all I'm reading about is that he's a distinguished war vet that I'm in. He's like, and you know, and I think most leftists typically when we see somebody being propped up as a distinguished war vet, we we're like, okay, that's fine. But that doesn't necessarily make you, uh, you know, somebody that we are going to rely on for our information. I'm not sure what that guy was up to in Afghanistan, but I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be thrilled about it if I knew more about what he was doing and when he was getting all of those decorations. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, I, I mean, that's one thing I would add. Um, yeah, but don't you think that, like, and I, I, I'm not trying to criticize Ken Klippenstein or reduce him to a mouthpiece of the fucking establishment. Obviously, his body of work does not suggest that that's who he is at all. I'm not, I'm not saying that. So, like, Whenever I criticize him, I'm not, I'm not just saying he's. Oh a no, I know. I just was okay. broadly speaking because he is taking a lot of shit. Oh, he definitely is, and a lot of it is incredibly like stupid and uncharitable and and just dumb. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with this information being out there. The only thing that I do think is a little bit weird is like, yeah, you can say that's how journalism works, but then we'll also constantly acknowledge the fact that people from within the deep state will tip off journalists to try to discredit whistleblowers yeah but then other... they don't do their follow-up homework ken did his follow-up homework and he released new verification verified evidence that was not at the time available to anyone else right but i'm just saying how is that really any different than the government tipping off a journalist like oh publish this dirt on fill in the blank whistleblower that we don't you know julian assange raped someone or whatever like it shouldn't like isn't that you know like you know what i'm saying but that wasn't true well there was a case it, there was like you know, he there's no proof that he actually did that, but there was like the this woman that accused him. I mean, sure, and and I and that's fair, but I think that's a little bit different than multiple documented psychiatric evaluations. You know, a quote from your wife that refers to you as an alcoholic. Uh, you know, Ken goes on to make the point where he says, like, oh, if you found out that your surgeon was an alcoholic, like, would that impact your decision making? Because you know that that's going to impact their decision making, right? Uh, you know, and I think that these are all fair things to analyze when you have a star witness a star guy, uh, I think that I think we have to be able to draw our own conclusions, right? And my conclusion that I drew when I read about what happened to Julian Assange, I don't think that there's anything wrong with a journalist publishing that uh, Sweden did uh, look at pursuing a case about uh, Julian Assange stealthing someone and basically trying to have sex with her without a condom on after they'd agreed to have sex with a condom. Uh, and then they realized there wasn't enough evidence to go uh, for that. Do I think that that discredits all the reporting that Julian Assange has done? Absolutely not, because I'm capable of like understanding both of those right. things. That's why I don't think that Ken did anything wrong when he said, uh, you know, hey, uh, this guy, you know what? We might need to take this into consideration. Make of it what you will. This is documented, and he and he also didn't actually go after the guy for PTSD, right? And that's something that else that he clarifies here. That's the that's what the guy says is what cause or is like the crux of his alcohol addiction. And and while I believe him and that I think that he should seek treatment for that, uh, you know, it's not just like a wipe the slate clean. Like oh, I'm allowed to be an alcoholic because I've been a victim of PTSD. Lots of people who almost the majority of people who struggle with addiction have been victims of or you know do struggle with intense things uh, like. PTSD. They have experienced hardcore trauma, um, right? But that doesn't, ex you know, that doesn't change the fact that the substance abuse problem is going to impact your judgment. And I think it's fair for people to have that in consideration when they're talking about something narrowly like this. When it is relying on a, a star witness, that's why everybody knows this guy's name. Yeah, no, that's totally fair. And like I said, I'm not trying to say that Ken deserves like, you know, I, I don't really think there's like this is that big of a deal. Um, but I would just say like 
going back to the Assange example, and not that David Grush is in any way fucking analogous to Julian Assange as far as like their status as being a fucking hero. Obviously, I'm not I'm not saying that, but like don't let the deep state get to you, Gavin. <laughs> I'll, I'll swear to you, they're they're reaching you. Don't let them fight them off. But like obviously I wouldn't care if a reporter just report like found out about and reported on what happened with the Sweden uh, rape charge or whatever. But if some U.S. intelligence official like specifically see, but that's the thing when you say U.S. intelligence official, people imagine somebody that's like way higher up. Do you know how many thousands and thousands of people in the state of or the city of D.C. are employed by the government? They make up like it's very bureaucratic. Like to say that like that information can't come from anybody. Like no, like, that's how information gets out. We rely on those people. Fair enough. Fair enough. I don't know, man. I just seen a lot of fucking like the DOJ, know. like, but that's how they fear. That's how they scare you away from it. That, like, isn't that itself a tactic? Like, you know, it, like how often would a, like a Trumpian Republican be like, it's the deep state. It's the DOJ that's coming after Donald. Like, do you know what I'm saying? Like to just use it as like a scary figure of like, oh, the DOJ or the FBI or whatever. Well, I think does. Like, I mean, we kind know how the DOJ it. and the FBI. That's what Donald Trump would say when they're coming after him We're for not, the fucking January how, 6th. He's not a whistleblower, bro. This is a different situation. This guy. This that's what his audience would say all the time. You can't trust the DOJ. You can't trust the FBI. You can't trust the alphabet agencies. Anything that comes from them is okay. a lie. Well, if you want to just reduce my argument down to a caricature of faux populism that's espoused by right wingers, I'm like not. I'm, you drew my. You said Julian Assange, bro. I I can't draw the opposite fucking character. We're both making our case. bro. Trump's not a whistleblower. Julian Assange is, and so is David Grush. That's the comparison. I mean, uh, fair enough, but uh, the the broader point still states that if you portray anything, any information that comes from the DOJ or uh, anything that comes from as deep state information, like how are we ever like you could call the fucking uh, 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 Edward Snowden and stuff, stuff that came from, you know, deep in the NSA. And it's like, yeah, it is. It did come from deep in the NSA. And Edward Snowden was one of those deep state guys before he decided to, uh, you know, release well, that information totally to the public different. that's a totally different situation but we can keep playing this video um and hear what you know ken has to say to Sagar's criticisms anything positive that i'd gotten unfortunately i didn't get anything now that doesn't mean that he doesn't have you know redeeming qualities everybody does even me uh so uh but i just didn't happen to hear any of that and so i had to go with what you know i was told and uh to give you guys a sense too i can speak to the characteristics of the sources because i understand why people are concerned about that because mm -hmm. most of the reporting that you read is planted when you go to the new york times most of those stories are planted by committee chairs by the white house whatever it is that's not how i roll i know i tend to talk to mid-level people mm -hmm. people kind of like grush mm -hmm. gs 14s gs 15s people who are experienced but didn't quite have the political chops generally to make it to the top so those are the types of people that i was talking to just full disclosure if you want to ask anything else about sure. i'm happy to sure. talk about yeah that. so i mean basically you're being accused of like this is a smear job you're trying to undermine his credibility what did you see as the value of this information do you think that the fact that he has a ptsd diagnosis makes him more likely to lie make things up and less credible in general no absolutely not ptsd um, but, you know, in the police reports, his wife called him an alcoholic and said that this happened repeatedly. Mm. That, I think, is a concern. I think that if someone's an alcoholic, yeah, that should be factored into your assessment of what their credibility is. But Right. But if it's alcohol related to PTSD, I mean, let's be here. I mean, he in sworn testimony. He admits he had a problem with PTSD. He says it was, I mean, I'm assuming he's related to these alcoholic incidents. He got treatment per your own reporting. Um, and all of the incidents he's now testified to, sworn testimony, as well as the whistleblowers post treatment so I, I i'm just trying to the other thing is is just to put, put a little bit of pushback here it's it does seem like a like it's uh it, it does seem like a pretty easy way to dismiss like a, a what i would say is a pretty large factor here like there's absolutely no effort to grapple with how his alcohol addiction could at all impact his judgment uh and instead it's just swept under the rug well he he got treated for ptsd and He's not an alcoholic anymore. And that's just like a fundal, fundamental misunderstanding of how uh, this would impact somebody's like day to day life. Yeah, I mean, I'm still a little like I've known alcoholics. They're not like making up stories about how they know information about UFOs. Like I I'm not saying it's not relevant. Like I said, I'm glad to know this about David Grush as someone who wants to believe what Grush is saying. I'm actually glad to know more about him. I don't think it's wrong to know this about him. It's not like I think it's a really a violation of his privacy he tried to become a public figure so like i said i am glad to know that he has struggled with alcoholism and ptsd those are both things that i think are important as far as him being a whistleblower and, and what he's trying to reveal to the public i i'm not sure if i agree that there's much of a correlation 
between having a drinking problem and like going on this crusade to expose the government for its, you know, concealing evidence of UFOs. Like, you know, not really. No. I mean, like I said, I've known plenty of alcoholics and people with addiction problems. Maybe if he was addicted to like some psychedelic substance or something crazy, but like, I, I just, I just don't personally see the, like, like, oh, clearly that's it. He's an alcoholic. Therefore, he's a fucking lunatic and a liar. I, Well, I didn't say that at all. I just said that I think that it, I think that it, it's not without something to consider, well, the, especially the when they're. Then? If it's not that he's a lunatic and a liar, is it, he's so drunk he just misremembered or something. No, like, but when you're relying on a star w witness, a star whistleblower, and you you know, it's not like they're coming out here and being like, "Yep, here is the aliens. Here's the evidence. Here's how it works. Here's what's going on. Here's the information that we have." They're relying on this guy. They're relying on this guy. And I think that when you're relying on that guy and that guy has been known to have some of these issues that, that yes, that deserves to be brought into question. Now, I'm not saying that it makes you anything. I'm saying that it, 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 it does allow people to ask those questions, right? right? It does. Like, you, you know, when you say like, uh, like people who, who like what, just because you like drink a lot, like, yes, uh, long-term that will impact your judgment, just like long-term use of opiates, just like long-term use of anything. Right. And it will make you more uh, amenable and malleable to ideas. There's the whole idea about the opiate generation of Fox news right because when they were taking all of these drugs they became uh more and more uh receptible to the arguments that were being parroted to them all over time there's uh, like documented evidence of this so more along the lines of what i'm saying is is that he could have misled himself yeah if you are getting drunk and you're looking at documents and you want to believe something yes i think it's fair to say that if you're repeatedly drinking it's easier to convince yourself of something uh you know and i think that if when you're dealing with again a critical critical witness in an argument that is a bombshell uh, yeah, those things start to start to come into question. Fair enough. I mean, Trump apparently fucking convinced himself of a lot of crazy, deranged conspiracy theories. He's a sober guy his entire life. Like there are many examples. Well, he also of is known to be taking uh, like diet pills, which have amphetamines in them. So I don't know if we could call Trump a sober guy. Fair enough. Fair enough. I'm just saying, like, I think you could find lots of examples of sober people that, you know, think crazy things and lots of examples. I'm not saying that it's you not can, but I'm just saying that information. Like I said, I am glad to know that Grush is an alcoholic or was an alcoholic or whatever. Like, I'm not saying that's not relevant information. I'm, I'm glad I know it a hundred percent. Um, but again, I just don't really see the correlation between like, if he had said, I saw a UFO, then again, I think that would be more relevant because it's like, well, maybe you were just drunk and like hallucinating or something. But if you're just going on this whole quest as a whistleblower, and by the way, he's going through the proper channels as a whistleblower. You keep people keep saying, like, I'm not well, denying he, that he believes it, Gavin. Well, Zach, let me finish. You keep you and other people keep saying, well, he hasn't actually shown any evidence. Like he's just saying he saw stuff. That's because if he actually said that stuff, what he knows, that would be illegal. He would be put in jail. He is saying what he can say legally right now. That's why he testified under oath about it. He's going through the proper channels as a whistleblower. It's not like he's just going out here like, you know, doing some crazy unheard of shit. Like he's doing the same process that other whistleblowers go through. Um, it just happens to be about something that, you know, people don't take it seriously. Um, but like, it's not like he's doing this crazy thing. He's basically just testifying in front of Congress and trying to raise awareness about something that the government is covering up based on knowledge he claims to know. Um, so I, I, just, Again, I don't. It, that, what? Oh, no, that's what I, that, that's why that's the, the hinging. That's where our disagreement hinges, Gavin. I think on that exact phrase that you just said uh, was what he claims to know. Uh, I haven't bought into what he claims to know being correct. Uh, and I would, and, and I, then that's, and we both agree that this is fair information. I think that both of us had just tipped us. You, you thought that it was irrelevant. I said, uh, this kind of adds to my skepticism. Right. And also I think fucking hilarious. JR Jr. You're about to get permabanned. Uh, Zach is defending the normative orthodox view on substance abuse. I'm a literal bartender, dude. One, you're getting the dunce cap. Um, <laughs> uh, but anyway, don't worry, Gavin. He's still cheering for <laughs> Yeah. Um, it's, it's definitely interesting. I, I honestly have mixed thoughts about it all. Because like I said, I don't think that it's like bad that we know this information. Um, I just don't really think it changes much of my opinion. Like I said, I, I don't think it's shocking that a guy who served in Afghanistan and was a decorated war hero has PTSD. Um, yeah, it, it's definitely weird that he had an episode and told his wife to kill himself or something because he was like drunk and uh, depressed or, or something. But again, I just don't necessarily see the correlation here. Like, you, you, like lots of great historical figures were drunk as fuck while they were like Winston Churchill, you know, was like drinking from morning till night. Like, I, I just don't know the correlation, you know, but it's 100%. not. Irrelevant. And I would, 
I would add that if Winston Churchill were making claims about aliens, I would also relate it to his drinking problem. Fair enough. But like I said, this isn't just some guy making a claim on Facebook. Last night I was in the cornfields and a UFO beamed me up. He's going through official government procedure to, you know, like as a whistleblower. Like, I, I just don't really think it's the same thing as some kook talking about how he, he saw a, a Martian in the sky. Fair enough. Fair enough. I'm, I, I will eat my shoe on air the, the second we get concrete evidence and not, you know, just this guy making testimony, though. I, that's that's all I'll say. But do you want to keep playing this out? Or, or Yeah, I mean, there's lots of government secrets that we'll probably never know the truth about. I don't know within our lifetimes if we're going to get the truth about who killed JFK. Or we have way more evidence about JFK than we do for aliens. I don't know, bro. We have 60 years of testimony from lots of people about testimony. We have fucking evidence for JFK. <laughs> the magic bullet. There's no way. Make that shot. Nobody can nobody's made the shot do you know how many expert marksmen have come far better marksmen than existed at the time of the kennedy assassination nobody can make and, that shot and no scientist can explain the tic tac ufo and its propulsion mechanism i mean you could say the same thing about yet <laughs> right okay <laughs> anyway okay, this... here, and here's what i did i'm not disputing that there are ufos there are definitely ufos i am disputing that it's extraterrestrial well, the thing about David Grush is that he never claims it's extraterrestrial. He always says non-human origin, but he leaves the door open. He never says aliens. He's never once said non-human. I dispute. That's uh, I, I mean, I thought that that's what extraterrestrial meant. I, I think that they're they're man operated. Or maybe it's not. He doesn't use that. I forget if it's non-human, but he uses some vague term that keeps it like he never says aliens. He's not like the Martians and the aliens like he's he, he refers to these spacecrafts as things that are not like capable of being engineered by um, like america let alone any other country so he's not saying they're aliens just so we're clear that that's that's totally fair and what i would really believe that it is gavin if, if I, in this we, we can let it play but i think that it's in my view that's the stuff that we don't even know about that's like have hidden through like 80 different layers of privatization and like trade secret laws um that even like 99.9 percent of the united states military apparatus doesn't know about because private business has gone so far ahead of what the military's even been able to construct that would be my my analysis based on my understanding of capitalism but i mean again i'm prepared to eat my shoes yeah it's it's a it's a fascinating conversation and that's definitely possible you know i'm not i'm not claiming that it 100 percent is ufos i'm not a fucking like crazy person you know i just think it's a interesting phenomenon but anyway let's keep watching this i understand like what is the value of this information being put forward. And to be clear, you didn't do anything wrong. You're doing your job. We get crazy tips from people all the time here. Um, so I have no issue with the Freedom of Information Act, even if you did report it, even if you did get a tip from the Intel community, I guess it comes down to like the framing and the substance of like, what are we supposed to do with this information? Well, I included in the story uh, an yeah. example of the dozens of White House um, staffers who had their clearances revoked for smoking weed, including in 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 um, states where it was legal, right? Places where it's legal. So, like, this is part of the clearance process. Uh, and so, again, this whole focus on PTSD, it, and if it makes him not credible, that was never something I said. That mm -hmm. was a focus that he made, trying to get ahead of the story in the statement that he put out. My interest was always the alcoholism, and I mean, I guess just to I I feel as though there's some kind of grandstanding around this stuff because the reality is, if you're gonna say get a medical procedure go see a surgeon you find out he's an alcoholic that's probably gonna factor in your deciding somewhat right right uh well i mean is he an active alcoholic do you know that we know that well, from the reports his wife said he was okay in 2018 yes but we don't know anything since then no. right so can can you speak a little bit too because part of the piece you talk about how you know in those instances you had white house staffers fired that there is this you know very onerous procedure to get and maintain your security clearances in this instance you know they they knew about these um police interactions and what had happened with regard to his uh his wife at the time they knew about the allegations of um, alcohol abuse all of this stuff and yet he was able to maintain his clearances do you read something nefarious into that? Or is that an indication in his direction that, listen, they knew everything and they still thought that I was trustworthy enough to maintain these very high level secret clearances? That's what he said. And I think there's something to that, but there's also something of a um, boys club. I don't mean in a, in a gender way. I mean, mm -hmm. in like a senior level people tend to look out for each other. I quoted someone as saying that. And that was the general frustration of multiple people that I talked to was feeling like they described this guy as unreliable and they were frustrated that this stuff that they knew about was not being accounted for. And these they were seeing the descriptions I was describing before, decorated hero, decorated hero. Right. They didn't feel like that was the whole story. I guess what I'm confused by is you're telling me this, but you don't quote any of these people in the story. Everything, the only facts that you can really attest to in the story are FOIA. 
And I do think this is a fair uh, point by Sagar that Sagar makes up, right? That or, that Sagar brings up, right? Whereas the fact that he's like, okay, well, you say that you're relying on all these like middle people who feel this way, but they also aren't willing to even like give you quotes on background. And I think that, and and just to be fair to everyone, I think that I think that that's a a, a, a good point. If they if there were serious doubts about this man's credibility and credentials, I would have liked to see some of the people who apparently felt like they could say these things to Ken Clippenstein feel like. They can say, hey, Ken, you can put this in your article. You know, you don't have to, you know, keep this out because I do think it's a fair point. And I did want to add before we got, uh, you know, struggled in on this. Obviously, I wasn't trying to, you know, mischaracterize Gavin's argument over here. I know you're not a fucking crazy person, but I did do I do. I read a lot of r slash UFO last night, bro. And there are not a lot of people who are as grounded in your <laughs> uh, fucking quest, man. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of crazies for sure. Um, and obviously, no, you don't have to like clarify that. Obviously, we're just like having a passionate discussion. Lots of fun. No problem at all. Um, and obviously I'm not saying you're a fucking pro establishment. No, that's okay. That's good content for us. You know, we really need to stir up Jr. He's, you know, he's, uh, he's, you know, he's, he's starting to kick and scream a little bit. Yeah. And by the way, I do agree. I think that, and I think that's one of the issues people had with Ken's article too, is that it's kind of like, you know, I talked to some people that didn't want to be named that said he was unreliable. It's like, well, what does that mean? Like, why, why, why couldn't you name them? What was he unreliable at doing? Like what? That's very vague. And if you're just not even naming these random intelligence people, then it is like, then it does kind of open the door to like, well, were you just like giving dirt on this guy because they're trying to make him look bad and trying to discredit him? So they told you, oh yeah, he's super unreliable guy. Can't trust him, but don't quote, don't quote us on that. And don't add our name. Like, I don't know if that was necessary to include in the analysis. If you can't actually substantiate it, um, might've, if I was Ken, I probably just would have left it at what we know for a fact that being the FOIA request um, because that does start to just feel like you know like oh I, I worked with I talked to some people that used to work with Zach at Sarpino's and they said he was a real dick like okay honestly dude that's exactly what I thought about I was like guys none of my old co-workers are gonna have anything nice to say about me guys I was chief at doing the least amount of work and trying to get the most amount of pay okay I was fucking out for number one when I was like 19 years old at Sarpino's I was like taking like fucking south fives with north fives i was like if there's a five dollar tip on there that's fucking mine let's go you know what i mean i was not a comrade at that age i didn't understand i was looking out too much for my own rent money so anyway they, i'm sure they don't have good things to say over me. they're like he says he's the comrade fuck that guy like yeah i know i'm sorry bro it's 19 <laughs> yeah. um in turn and obviously the tip and again zero issue with that but don't you think that's the actual relevant part? I mean, why aren't you quoting people on background? People who work for him, you said he's unreliable. You're, you're saying it here. I think that's fine. I mean, obviously, sure. it's a public forum. But the way that it's being read, and I have to be honest with you, I respect your work. But, you know, the assemblage of the facts here, it does kind of read as a smear job. You're basically like, he had a PTSD incident, or okay, he says it's a PTSD incident. He had two alcoholics. You quote two people who basically say, you know, he's, he's full of it. Um, you only quote one expert who says that the UFO hearing is a travesty. And I mean, one of the things I really don't understand is you, we've, we, how many conversations we had about Pentagon spinning us. We are credulously citing the explanation, the 1990s explanation on Roswell, and credulously quoting like Susan Goh, who's the Pentagon spokesperson who said that he's full of it. I mean, why should we believe these people? Do you understand what I'm saying? The assembly oh, totally. of the facts in your story yes. you're taking is like, and this guy's a liar. That's I think that's saying. a good instinct. You yeah. don't want to side with the institutions, but I think yeah. you also don't want to reflexively oppose them. I'm not saying that you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that, uh, right. you know, I have. We honed into that. And I think that it honestly, I think that the reason that you can trust the Vanguard is because depending on the day, we're both going to be like, fuck the establishment. But also like they do get a lot of good talent over there. Let's sift through what the fuck they had to say first before we're like, not like again, it's like Letitia James. Would I have beef with her like on 90 percent of issues? Yes. But when she brings a fucking uh, indictment at Donald Trump for not paying taxes with his scam organization, I'm like, yeah, base Letitia. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's the way it goes. <sighs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's an interesting question. It's a very fine line to walk as a reporter um, when you're dealing with this sort of information, because you really do have to wonder when it comes to sensitive stories like this, like what's what's being fed to me? What, what are they trying to plant a story like, you know, I, I, there's a lot of interesting considerations that go on there. But overall, I mean, based on Ken Klippenstein's track record, I don't think there's any reason to believe he's just like at, try, intentionally trying to act as a mouthpiece of the Defense Department or of the government or anything like usually this guy is, you know, coming with hard hitting anti-establishment journalism, exposing government malfeasance and all sorts of stuff. So like, I, I'm not I'm not in any way saying that 
Ken is a smear artist or a mouthpiece of the establishment. I have some specific questions or gripes about this article, but overall, I don't think it's fair to like cast his journalistic integrity into question, even if you disagree with this take. Oh, 100%. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to add that this is this was kind of exactly where we we're at, where it's like, uh, depending on the day, Sagar will be like, well, it's from the Department of Justice. And then on the depending on the other, well, can we really trust this coming from the Department of Justice? You know, and every leftist does the same thing. So I just wanted to point it out from right, right. <laughs> have that tendency too, um, but again, these are not monoliths. The mm-hmm. DOD, I'm not talking to the public affairs officer. I'm not talking to the senior executives. I generally try to go out and get a sense of like the mid-level kind of like rank and file people because I think they tend to tell a more honest story. You talk to the politicals and it's just for- I agree with you. I think you're you know doing I mean? the right thing. And right. you always, and I've always, you know, I've stood by no. a lot of your work, but I'm like, why aren't any of these people quoted then? Why right. aren't you quoting these people? Well, essentially, action? the reason yeah. that I did the FOIA was because they're kind of describing it as unreliable. I'm thinking, well, do I want to just use this sort of innuendo? Mm. Can I try to substantiate it? And if you look at the FOIA request, you can FOIA my FOIA, or I think I posted it too. You did. I asked for a yeah. whole range of right. things. So this idea that I was being pointed at one specific event, that's just not true. People were describing things to me. Mm-hmm. It sounds like there's certain themes. I go on Nexus, which journalists have, and so you can find their home address. The home address was not furnished to me. And then you can just file a FOIA, and I did it for like seven years. And so that was what came back. So okay. there's no sort of like, so I guess my answer to your question, I'm not trying to be evasive. Mm-hmm. Like I did talk to intelligence and, and DOD people. But um, the way in which that influences the reporting is a little bit more subtle than I think the, the discourse gives credit to. It's not like they're pointing you at one specific event. They give you a sense. And then. And the other thing that I think is, is kind of interesting is, is just to add to your argument, Gavin, I think it still would have been better for him to include both. Because I get the point that he's making where he says, oh, I didn't want to just like personally attack the guy because then I'm in the same position where I'm like, it, he's saying this and I'm saying this about him and nobody really has any ground to stand on because we don't have proof. Right. And, and I get that, you know, your point that this guy literally would go to jail if he tried to say what his, you know, what he saw because he's, you know, he had uh, clearance and all that stuff with the DOD and whatnot. But I think it's also fair to say like, hey, you know, put the meat and potatoes in there from the FOIA request and then say, see how this kind of creates a more full picture with the quotes from these individuals saying like, here's where he had a lapse of judgment. Here's where he was spending 18 hours a day, uh, you know, reading about UFOs uh, and watching InfoWars, like whatever he was doing. Right. Like, I'm, and, and that was a, that was a joke. He, he didn't do that. But, I, you know, yeah. things that would <laughs> kind of make you question his, uh, you know uh what's it credentials or you know his um reliability as a or you know whistle yeah right I, I honestly think those details would be more interesting and more insightful as to david grush's character right like if that was the case if he was this just terrible fucking employee who was never reliable always making shit up you know watching info wars or something like you said zach like i would actually find that a lot more interesting than oh this guy has ptsd and you know, seven years ago, he had like an episode where he was going to kill himself or something like I, I just I personally find I think that would be more insightful information, um, because let's be honest, at some point in everyone's life, most people have struggled with substance abuse of some kind, even if it's just for a brief period of time. Yes, but I think it's an effort to portray it as a brief period of time when you have both wives, both of his ex wives referring to him as an alcoholic and you have such a wide stretch of time between hospitalizations i think making oh well he he had ptsd and a drug and an alcohol problem back here but no you know now does he it's like like that's where i take issue with it because that's quite simply just not how those mental illnesses manifest was it two two wives i thought it was just one i believe i heard them say in this clip that he had two wives and both of them referred to his drinking problems interesting i thought it, okay yeah you're his ex-wife and his current wife yeah you're right sorry um yeah, I'm not saying, like I said, I'm not saying it's like completely irrelevant. Um, I, I just personally would be more interested in details about how he acted on the job and substantiated, you know, instances of him being so-called unreliable or, you know, uh, any other thing like actual evidence that would point to his unreliability. Um, that the substance abuse thing is definitely relevant. I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying I think that would be even more important or interesting to me. A hundred percent. And and JR brings up the point saying that recovery isn't real. And and that's actually not true, JR. But there the thing that people would be saying is that, oh, he's not an alcoholic anymore. They would be saying, This man's been in recovery for X number of years. This happened in twenty eighteen. Yes, he received help. He meets, you know, uh he does he takes care of himself. He has uh, you know, a therapist. This is what he needs to do in order to maintain a healthy lifestyle. And you know what, he's 
making amends for the, you know, whatever problems that he had beforehand. That's how they would be responding to this because that's how somebody that's gone through the program, that's how somebody that is like, you know, bettering themselves and taking initiative acts, right? That's, that's just what they do. I know fucking people in the program, guys. Like, this is a, this is, this is what you have to do. And the way that they're addressing this, I'm like, this guy, this guy probably, like, maybe he feels like he has his life under control, but the way that they're portraying this, I'm like, it seems like probably he's 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 an active user, and I, I just think that that is something that you have to take in consideration when you're a star witness about a case yeah. that involves aliens. Oh, for sure, for sure, it is uh, important information. Um, that being said, I, even if it is the case that the dude is still to this day an alcoholic, it's also possible that he is an alcoholic and he is a whistleblower that knows things that need to be revealed. Like True. that can be possible. Um, Lars von Trier was directing some of the best films of the 2000s drunk out of his fucking mind. Like, I mean, high functioning addicts absolutely do exist. Oh, 100 percent. And yeah, and it's not like a it's it's 100 percent not a like a, a character assassination. And I don't mean it to come across that way, guys, at all. Like th that, like this isn't a, like a shot at David Grush. Like, I, I, I hope that he is in recovery. I hope that he is, you know, doing that. I just think that, look, if, if you're if you're getting security clearance and, you know, Ken brought up a great point. How many Obama staffers got fucking or Obama, excuse me, Biden, Freudian slipped. Uh, how many Biden staffers got fired for smoking weed and getting all of their clearances revoked? You know what I'm saying? It's, it clearly is a boys club, right? And clearly, you know what, to some extent, he is a part of that boys club. Uh, so it's not like he's some like cr out outsider and you can draw like pros and cons uh, from both of that. But it, I think it also adds context. And I think that's, again, one of the more interesting elements that, you know, through all of this, you know, I think that Ken could have driven home that, you know, he is still kind of a member of, of the boys club, uh, you know, and, and what does that say about him? And, and we, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, it's definitely um, it's definitely a, a lot to unpack here and everybody's free to make up their own mind. Um, yeah, uh, for sure. And I feel and like this is the most level headed conversation that mainstream media would have over something like alien reporting between Sagar and uh, Ken. And obviously, Crystal is engaging, too. But I feel like Sagar is the one that's really like wants to fucking talk about. Exactly. And by the way, I do totally agree that David Grush should be more transparent with the status of his alcoholism or his recovery. Like the fact that I, I, I don't love his response to this piece, to Ken's piece. He should have just been like, yes, this is true. I have struggled with these things. I am in recovery or not like he should have just been honest about it and, and not acted like he was, you know, the sub or the victim of some sort of like a smear. Um, because, yeah, like, dude, you are a public figure. You are the star witness and you are making incredible claims. So to act like this is not something that should be at least known by people that take you seriously, that is dumb. And, yeah, he should be more transparent and, and specify whether he still is struggling with alcoholism or if he's in recovery. 100 uh, percent. I'm about to have to jump off here in like five minutes. Gavin, do you want to play these out or do you want to react to the super chats? I'm not sure what's going to be easier for you. I think we kind of, I don't know what else we're going to, you know, even talk about. It seems like we kind of got to the, you know, meat of our disagreement. We got to hear Sagar call Ken Klippenstein's article a smear job to his face. That was pretty spicy, but overall still a really, you know, polite and respectful exchange of uh, ideas or a debate, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I thought that was great content. Oh, a hundred percent. And dude, honestly, Ken, Ken is so respectful like he's like no that's your opinion that it's a smear job bro you call my piece a smear job i'm coming over the table i'm like oh you want to you want to talk about this what's the last piece that you broke huh you want to talk about this you want to look at the score like if i was ken i would be flexing so hard i'd be like oh i'm sorry let me parade out all of my accolades uh you want to call me a smear job you know like <laughs> foya's my middle name dog i am like the literal best reporter in the game one of my other I, I one time ken and i glanced at each other and he tried to decide if he knew who i was and then i think he decided he didn't but i was still proud of myself <laughs> yeah lol yeah don't come on our fucking show telling us about how our reporting is a smear lee camp anyway <laughs> yeah. anyway no they're they're far more professional than we'll ever be and then i think they actually do really like each other and they wanted oh, yeah. to make sure that the audience didn't think there was like bad beef but uh again all of these things man no love for the short kings on this <laughs> podcast jeez i'm like i'm like i need to, I'm, I'm gonna get the i'm gonna get that silicon valley treatment where you spend like eight hundred thousand dollars to grow two inches you know what i mean and then you're joints hurt until you die <laughs> yeah uh there's another surgery we can also grow a couple inches it might cost around the same amount of money but you know fortunately i don't need that <laughs> anyway shout out to you Rick. don't need to look any more like a horse you know what I'm... <laughs> shout all out right to... moving on <laughs> i did see this zachary yeah zach actually sent me a screenshot of this this morning he was like bro did you see this shit yeah i did um and honestly it was the least surprising thing i've ever seen after his like rambling bizarre snl 
monologue. Um, I was like, yep, that checks out. If you guys remember, he went on this weird like anti-vax tirade disguised as comedy on SNL. Uh, and yeah, now he's an RFK supporter. Yeah. LOL. Shout out to you, Zachary. That was also that was very cringy. I did send that to fucking Gavin this morning. <laughs> I uh, love also, you guys Nelson, have... though. He's a great oh, actor. Great actor, dude. Except and, and also embarrassing that uh Jack Harlow or whatever, Dave Harlow or whatever that guy's name is, uh, the like white curly haired kid from Kentucky that like has that like what's poppin song. Anyway, he's he's playing Woody Harrelson's character and and white men can't jump. And, oh, uh, that is so just, cringy. The, dude, the remake of that looks so bad. And that movie is like an iconic film. But anyway, shout out to Zach. Also, and if shout- anyone, oh, one sec, if anyone wants to see Woody Harrelson play a based communist, watch the movie Triangle of Sadness. Such a great, hilarious, anti-capitalist movie. And Woody Harrelson is easily the funniest part of it. Um, so despite his recent hijinks, uh, do check out Triangle of Sadness if you want to see what might be my favorite Woody Harrelson performance. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then quickly, I'll shout out this guy really quick before I leave, because this is like you guys have the worst taste. You guys have just like horrible taste. It's like you think Anna's hot and so is Kamala Harris. Anna Kasparian, Kamala Harris. Not going to be my first choice if I'm just plucking women off the Internet. But hey, that's uh, <laughs> personality plays a role into it for me, I guess. LOL. Yeah. Shout out to you, Sam. You got you horny motherfuckers. I saw another comment about Anna's being hot, too. I was like, Keep it, keep it to yourself. Keep it in your uh, pants, Jesus. <laughs> uh, and then the one last one that I wanted to react to before I get out of here really quickly is this one. What is one criticism you have of the Oppenheimer movie? I don't know the fucking length. Could you fix it? I don't know what they would have cut out. I'm not an editor, but I could you have fucking put it into like, I don't know, maybe 245. I think that there's something you could have worked with there. <laughs> I really liked it. I didn't have a ton of criticisms of it, but if I'm just going for the easy one, it's like, yeah, I don't typically love to rewatch movies that are three fucking hours. I really liked the movie. And if it had been, shorter i probably would find myself rewatching it more uh but that's hardly a criticism it's just more of like a there's only so many hours in the day yeah i, I would say if i had one criticism of it and by the way minor spo- minor spoiler so if you haven't seen oppenheimer mute your like speakers for the next 30 to 60 seconds but um the very last shot of the movie i thought was a little unnecessary a l- maybe a little heavy-handed i'm not gonna lie because the the movie ends with such a great like scene of uh oppenheimer speaking with albert einstein and i really think it was a great great like final scene i love that um but then i i do think it kind of makes the point like again in a little bit of a too obvious way by literally being like like showing the earth fucking engulfed in flames being like yeah everyone like nuclear war is going to lead to us all dying essentially which was already pretty obviously the point of the film and that last scene so I don't know if we needed to see that, like visualize, like oh shit, the world blowing up. Like I, I'm, I'm mixed. Fe- I have mixed feelings on it because part of me was like, yeah, it was a very powerful image. It definitely was. Um, but I also think it could have just ended with that conversation between Oppenheimer and Einstein, and you kind of would have gotten the same thematic effect without the heavy-handed visual. But like I said, it's a nitpick. It's not like it's not. It didn't ruin the movie for me in any way. Also, Cosette, do you just want us to lie? We both like fucking loved the movie. I gave it a nine out of ten. Um, I mean, if if you didn't like it as much as we did, then you probably have more criticisms. But it's not like we're withholding our criticisms because we're afraid to be honest. No, it's just that we liked the movie more than you. Um, but yeah, overall, I thought it was a damn near. Also, I don't. Oh, what? I don't mean to interrupt, but I have no audio for some reason. I tried to take out my headphones so that I could hear what was going on while I was getting ready. And now I have absolutely no audio. So I'm just going to say peace out to everyone and shout out to my favorite hate watcher, J.R. Jr. You know, I said uh, I could disagree with you about everything on politics, uh, but if, if you can make me laugh, I, I still fuck with you. So that's you, J.R. Jr. You're like the Vosh of this live stream. So shout out to you, man. I know that means a lot to you. LOL. Yeah. See you later, Zach. Um, I guess I'm here alone. I'm going to put something up on screen just for the end of this live stream because I hate being the only thing on screen. Like I hate just taking up the whole fucking screen. Um, so I'm just going to throw like the Vanguard Twitter and, you know, encourage everyone co- to go follow us over there while I finish up the live stream. Um, got some notifications. Hey, um, yeah. Did you guys see this whack Peter Dow tweet? from earlier i like peter dow 
he genuinely seems like his heart is in the right place. He was the original campaign manager for Marianne Williamson, but he had a pretty weird take. He said, you can disagree with Robert Kennedy on policy as vehemently as you want. You can love him or hate him, but conspiracy theorists is an establishment term designed to stop citizens from asking probing questions about their government. Like, sorry, sorry, Peter. Like I said, I respect you, but RFK Jr. is the definition of a conspiracy theorist, dude. Like, he was talking about how Wi-Fi gives you cancer, how the Ashkenazi Jews and the Chinese were immune to COVID. This guy, there is not a conspiracy theorist this motherfucker does not agree with or espouse. Um, <laughs> so again, like I'm not trying to be too hard on Peter. I think his heart is genuinely in the right place. But even if he, even if that was true, that RFK Jr. is not a conspiracy theorist, which it obviously is. What about the fact that he defends apartheid Israel? What about the fact that he's literally an opponent of universal health care? What about the fact that he's to the right of Joe Biden on immigration? Like, are, are these not valid reasons to, to completely disqualify a candidate from your support? I don't understand that. Um, and, and something else that uh, RFK said a couple of times on the Jimmy Dore show that I was surprised more people didn't like talk about was that fucking rfk jr was literally criticizing joe biden for not completing donald trump's border wall they call this dude a leftist people like peter dow talk about him like he's a fucking leftist but he's to the right of joe biden on immigration he was criticizing joe biden from the right for not finishing donald trump's stupid fucking border wall are you kidding me what a monster anyway that's a that's a side note i was just looking through the vanguard mentions um also this was pretty funny Watch this. Uh, here's here's Ron DeSantis and his wife. And he was there to go pick up my kids when I couldn't. And he did it with humility and he did it with love. And I'll tell you what, can't ask for a better husband than that. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, I so. How does it feel? How does it feel to hear her say that? I mean. Well, look, that's, you know, you know, in sickness and in health, that's, that's what you sign up for. I mean, and oh. so she's uh, not only my wife. Look how fucking lame he looks at this angle, too. I don't know what it is about him, but he just looks so fucking lame. Uh, and listen to that again at the beginning. Uh, <laughs> and he was there to go pick up my kids when I couldn't. And he did it with humility and he did it with love. And uh, so if you guys aren't aware, Casey DeSantis had, I think, breast cancer, some sort of cancer. So she's talking about the fact that during her bout with cancer, Ron DeSantis had to go pick up the kids. And, and that's her, not not their kids, my kids. She says, uh, <laughs> and he was there to go pick up my kids when I he was there to go pick up my kids, not our kids, my kids. Um, <laughs> and that's her example of what a great fucking dad he is he picked up the kids and he did it with humility and love like i'm sorry but when i was a kid my dad would drop me off at school every fucking morning and sometimes would pick me up like <laughs> how is that a fucking how is that like a how is that a high bar at all how is that something that's even like worthy of praising um he picked up the kids he picked up my kids from school like wow he's not a total fucking deadbeat maybe you should vote for this guy um <laughs> I thought that was funny as fuck too. Ron DeSantis is just is flopping so so hard. Um, but yeah, everyone, make sure to go uh, follow the Vanguard on Twitter. Like I said, I'm just gonna have this up here on screen so that I don't have to be the the sole focus of the screen right now. Got a couple more super chats to get through. Um, shout out to you, Robert. I hope you guys are gonna offer commentary on that shit interview Jimmy Dore did on Marianne Williamson. That was a smear job, pure and simple. Yeah, we already talked about that briefly at the beginning of the stream, Robert. It was totally a smear job, a complete and utter fucking hatchet job. One of the most dishonest interviews I've ever seen, especially given the fact that Jimmy puts on the kid gloves every time RFK comes on or any other right-wing hack who he likes. Um <laughs> So yeah, it was totally dishonest. He didn't even let her talk. He was cutting her off. It was embarrassing. But thank you for the five bucks, bro. Really appreciate that. A um, couple more super chats to address. Thank you so much, Rick, for the two bucks. Great show today, Vanguard boys. Well, thank you, Rick. Really appreciate that, man. Always great to see you in the chat. Also, thank you so much, Mike H., Dude, I got to disagree with you on this one, bro. The UFO alien stuff is basically on the level of Bigfoot at this point. Always hearsay and someone who says, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Mike, 
I, I get where you're coming from, and I understand why people don't want to believe in the UFO story. It's fine if you don't, but to say that it's on the same level of the Bigfoot stuff is just inaccurate. They are not having congressional hearings about Bigfoot. There's not whistleblowers coming out to expose the fact that the government is hiding evidence of fucking Bigfoot. Like, you, you can not take it seriously, or you can say, oh, it's just American military drones and not aliens. That's fine, but there's clearly something going on. Like we have pilots that are reporting sightings of these objects in the sky. Like this is more than just the Bigfoot stuff. Um, but anyway, I, I understand why people are skeptical. I, I truly do. Um, appreciate the five bucks, Mike. And thank you, Christian for the one ninety nine. alcohol and PTSD never made me hallucinate aliens. Yeah. I, 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 I kind of feel the same way, Christian. I don't struggle from PTSD myself, but I do know people that have had uh, PTSD and that have struggled with PTSD and it, it definitely affected their behavior. I'm not saying that it didn't, um, but it never affected their behavior in a way that would like, <laughs> like make them start claiming to have evidence of UFOs. Um, like it would be more of like an interpersonal, like, Oh, this person might like easily get triggered based on something that reminds them of their previous trauma like that's that's how ptsd manifests right like it can lead to people having like a short temper or maybe being easily triggerable or easily emotional um it, it definitely affects people's behavior don't get me wrong like the people that i've known that have ptsd like i can like it's clear that ptsd affects the way they live i'm not saying that it doesn't same with alcoholism but i just don't see a ton of evidence of there being a correlation between like people that have PTSD and people that believe in aliens or something. So again, it's not irrelevant information. I just don't know if it really proves anything. Like most people have struggled with substance abuse at one point in their life. A lot of people have dealt with PTSD at one point in their life. Is it good that we know this information? Yes. Um, ultimately, do I really think it's very um, like it's correlated to the whistleblower claims? I, I don't know. Anyway, thank you so much, Christian. Really appreciate that. And thank you so much, Rick, for the two bucks. Zach is right on JFK. No one was making that shot. Don't get me wrong, Rick. I wasn't saying that the JFK conspiracy is not a conspiracy. It absolutely is. I do not believe the official government line on JFK. That's not what I was saying. I agree with Zach that there's clearly like, you know, the official narrative is not correct. What I was saying is that we might never know the truth. We might literally die before the truth comes out about who actually killed JFK and the government's involvement in it. Right. Um, so for, that's why I was responding with Zach. He was like, you know, I'll eat my shoe when we get evidence of aliens. I'm like, well, just cause we never get evidence doesn't mean there's nothing going on in the same way that we might never truly find out the complete truth about the JFK assassination. That doesn't mean that the official narrative is correct. Um, so that's the point that I was trying to make because clearly I don't believe that the official narrative was correct. Rick, um, Today's a real tinfoil episode, uh, a tinfoil hat episode of the Vanguard. Sorry for all you serious people tuning in today, expecting some intellectual political commentary. And instead, I'm subjecting you to fucking UFOs and JFK and all this crap. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much, Rick. Really appreciate that, bro. Um, got another one from Walter. Thank you so much. So to grow all parody, sexy, sadie call it sexy Anna another another chat about Anna thank you so much for that Walter really appreciate it bro um and thank you Adi tuning in late but we'll go back and watch the whole thing for sure thank you so much Adi really appreciate the generous ten dollar super chat and I would definitely be interested in your take on our conversation on the subject of UFOs Adi Zach and I got into a really good little debate about that inspired by Sagar and Klin's, uh, Kin's debate on the subject matter. So I'd love to get your opinion on that, Adi. I'd love to get your two cents on the subject matter because um, it is a really interesting debate. Anyway, thank you so much for that, man. Really appreciate it. And thank you also, Mary. Really appreciate the $10, Mary. Tuned in late. My motto is work smart, not hard. Zach always. LOL. Yeah, that's, that's our motto too, uh, Mary. Zach and I, you know, it's not that we don't work but we don't really like to work super hard. Um, we like to, you know, come on here and talk with you guys and have fun together. But I'm definitely the kind of guy that after the show's over, I like to smoke a bowl. I like to relax while I edit. Um, so I guess I'm still working even after the show's over. You know, I usually spend an hour or two editing and making thumbnails and all that good stuff. So I guess I am a, a little bit more of a hard worker than I give myself credit for. But I'm sure compared to most of you guys, you know, I'm a lazy sack of shit. Anyway, thank you so much, Mary. 
really appreciate that. I think that's all the super chats. Um, I'm not seeing any other ones. So if anyone wants to ask any questions, you can send in a question. Um, I'll probably get out of here pretty soon, but we're having fun. We're having fun. Oh, shout out to you, man. Wait, what? You guys spoke about UFOs? I strongly believe that the probability of aliens existing in the history of universe is one. Yeah, I mean, I... Yeah, dude, I, I totally agree, bro. And yes, we did speak about UFOs. I don't know if you saw, Adi, uh, Ken Klippenstein, he recently did a report for The Intercept about David Grush, who's like the main whistleblower, who's, uh, you know, talking about the UFOs that the government's hiding. And uh, a lot of people, Sagar included, kind of thought that it was like a smear job, like a just a smear piece talking about how this guy used to be an alcoholic and has struggled with PTSD, basically just trying to like discredit him because he struggled with PTSD and alcoholism. Um, and it led to a really interesting debate between Kin and Sagar and between myself and Zach over the credibility of David Grush's claims and whether or not it's particularly relevant, the fact that he was an alcoholic and has struggled with PTSD. Um, so yeah, it was a great conversation, Adi. I think you'll really enjoy it. Um, and like I said, um, I'm glad to hear that you're on the same page. But either way, thank you so much, Roberto, as well. Late to the party. Did you address the Demi Marianne interview? Wish she would just completely want to stop aid. Um, different from RFK softball wish you would just say she completely yeah i mean i did see the interview we already talked about it roberto i thought it was a totally dishonest hatchet job um and incredibly disrespectful to marianne williamson who by the way is not a career politician we're not talking about fucking you know nancy pelosi or something we're talking about an activist and an author who's doing the right thing by running for president and challenging joe biden which by the way bernie sanders aoc Ilhan, like none of these progressives in congress have the balls to do what marianne is doing she's actually challenging joe biden for one um she's not a career politician um it's okay to disagree with her on the issue of uh ukraine and russia i disagree with her on that we've discussed it on the show so it's not it's not a problem that the you know conversation came up and i also agree that i wish she would completely you know want to stop aid and you know get the american involvement from the region out all that kind of stuff um but if you want to talk about that area of disagreement you have to like actually listen to what she's saying and 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 engage with that and not just smear her and talk over her and act like she's just repeating cnn talking points because she's stupid when obviously that's not the case like marianne is incredibly anti-war she's been advocating for peace her entire life um she's been advocating against uh nuclear proliferation for much of her political um you know like for much of the time that she's been a presence in politics right uh, so to act like this person is some sort of stooge of the establishment who needs to be embarrassed is just fucking insulting and ridiculous given her track record, given what we know about her. Um, so it's okay to disagree, but it's completely insulting to act like she's, she's some sort of like a tool of the deep state or of the MIC. It's just completely ridiculous. And like Zach said, the only reason he treated her like that was because people were criticizing him for softballing RFK. So he basically just brought her on to be a whipping boy. Uh, or a whipping girl, I guess. Like he, he wasn't actually interested in letting her share her perspective about the country or her vision for the country or her agenda. That wasn't what it was about at all. It was about making her look bad. It was about you know trying to trap her and 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 talk over her and disrespect her and get his rabid audience of right wing losers to fucking you know say oh Jimmy Dore, Jimmy Dore did such a good job. He fucking destroyed Marianne Williamson, even though she's doing the exact thing that we want her to do, which is challenge Joe Biden, the guy you guys claim to hate so much. Like these fucking people, they they talk so much about how they hate Joe Biden and how he's such an unacceptable piece of shit. And then this one fucking woman, this one progressive woman decides, hey, I'm going to do the, the thing that Bernie won't do, that AOC won't do, that none of these fucking progressives will do. I'm actually going to challenge him. I'm actually going to stand up and step up to the plate. And fucking run against this guy so that the American people can at least have an option to vote for someone with progressive politics. So at least there's some opportunity to contrast progressivism with the neoliberalism that Joe Biden represents. She did that. She fucking did that. And all you fucking assholes, all you Jimmy Dore assholes and fucking RBN clowns, all you want to do is fucking tar and feather her and act like she's a tool of the establishment and a stooge of the deep state because you disagree with her on three things. Fuck you. Fuck you. Anyway, I thought that debate was super fucking annoying. Based, Gavin. 
Hell yeah. Anyway. I guess that basically... Uh, oh, one more super chat. Thank you so much, Roberto. RBN does light pushback against Convo Couch Pro RFK talking points too. Shake my head. LOL. LOL. The Convo Couch is maybe the dumbest podcast on the internet. It's uh, it's 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 tough to give that award to anyone other than the RBN crew, right? Like, just, I mean, they, they seem like they obviously deserve that title of the dumbest fucking idiots online, at least on the left. But I think it has to go to the convo couch. I really do. I really do. Because even RBN wasn't, like, talking about the fucking, the Arizona audit. Like, remember they did, they funded pasta to go out and do some on the ground fucking reporting on the arizona audit <laughs> act like really leaning into the whole like stop the steal bullshit lol they're like we need a we need a focus on election integrity obviously just dog whistling to fucking rabid trump supporters plus one of them literally works in moscow like fiorella literally moved to moscow after russia invaded ukraine to do propaganda on rt right so one of them doesn't even live in america anymore one of them literally lives in moscow and is paid by russian oligarchs to do propaganda for rt like not rt america rt america for those of you guys who remember was actually kind of like based like people like jesse ventura and abby martin and people like that would like they worked for rt america and, and they didn't have any constraints on what they were talking about um they they could criticize russia all they wanted they could talk about anything frankly you know chris hedges worked for rt america um but then rt america shut down after the invasion of ukraine and then it just became rt and rt is different than rt america rt america the journalists that worked for rt america like chris hedges and jesse ventura they actually could say whatever they wanted and we talked to a lot of those people and, and they repeated that they were like we never were told not to say stuff we were never told not to criticize russia we were never told to do anti-america propaganda whatever but now the uh, like the RT is absolutely state sanctioned propaganda from Russia, a hundred percent. And even if you agree, by the way, with the Russian perspective, even if you agree with the propaganda, then you still have to admit it's propaganda, right? Like if Zach and I were being paid by NATO, if we were on the fucking NATO payroll, would you take what I was saying seriously on foreign policy? No, you wouldn't. You fucking wouldn't. Nor should you. Obviously, if I was being paid by fucking NATO or um, the American fucking government to give my commentary, obviously not. Everyone would fucking immediately stop taking me seriously for good reason. But somehow Fiorella Isabel can literally, <laughs> literally works for the Russian government, for the Kremlin, is paid by Russian oligarch blood money to do actual propaganda, literally the definition of propaganda for a warring nation <laughs> led by a right-wing authoritarian. And somehow she gets to go out here and parade around as a fucking leftist. What a joke. What a joke. LOL. Anyway, thanks for the super chat, Roberto. Um, I'm not surprised to hear that they did light pushback. That's the other thing about that whole crowd of the internet, like the whole RBN convo couch. Like, don't you guys get tired of having to talk to people like pasta and fear? Like <laughs> it's such a small echo chamber, right? Like sometimes I just feel bad for those people. I'm like, Oh, like, Oh, you got to have on pasta again. Cause there's no one else that takes you seriously. There's no one else that takes you seriously. So you have to bring on fucking pasta and pasta jardula. <laughs> And fucking Fiorella Isabel, who's literally a pro-war propagandist. That's how you have to talk to, because no one takes you seriously. Everyone that's actually on the left knows you're a fucking grifter and a loser. So you have to fucking hit up the convo couch to talk. <laughs> LOL. That's hilarious. Hope you guys had fun with that, though. LOL, Nico House. What a fucking loser. Do you know that guy proudly voted for ron DeSantis, and likes to tell other people that they aren't lefties he likes to challenge other people's leftist credentials credentials sorry even though he fucking proudly voted for ron DeSantis. lol 
L O L. Mm. Well, guys, I guess I'm probably going to get out of here. No more super chats to react to. So I'm probably going to edit a little bit. I might put out a clip of that UFO debate that Zach and I had. That was pretty good. That was pretty good stuff. But yeah, guys, I'm probably going to peace out of here. So, yeah. I guess a shout out to the Patreon community. Hopefully my audio is okay. I feel like my internet just got kind of wacky. But yeah, huge shout out to the Patreon community. Thank you guys so much for supporting the show. You can hit up the link in the description if you'd like to support our work. Really, really helps out. Just five bucks a month and you can get your own name up there on the shout out screen. So hit that up, guys. Hit it up, hit it up, hit it up. Cool. All right. Well, yeah, peace out, everyone. I'll see you next time, probably Sunday. I think Zach and I are taking the day off tomorrow, so probably Sunday. But yeah, we'll see you guys later. Shout out to the Patreon community. Hit up that link if you want to support the show. And hit that notification bell so you don't miss the next live stream. But yeah, thanks everyone for tuning in. Really appreciate it. We'll see you next time.